and throughout the part of the buildings and you can use the mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode. Okay. And open. Mm -hmm. the, the meeting's open. Okay, members, I'd like to welcome you all to the, the weekly meeting of the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Um, the first item on the agenda we have here is apologies, and we don't have any apologies, uh, so you're all uh, very welcome here this morning. Uh, chairperson's business, um, I want to advise members that I attended a conference in my capacity as chairperson on Tuesday evening hosted by the Belfast Food Network on the theme of food, farming and land, building a resilient future. And um, uh, I, want, I want to advise members that will also be attending a meeting on the 23rd of February along with the Chairperson of the Economy, Finance and Executive Committee and Infrastructure Committees with the House of Lords EU Committee. And this is to discuss our respective work and observations since the protocol come into operation on the 1st of January and follow, as a follow-up for the meetings we, we held last year. Um, in terms of the um, item three in the agenda, draft minutes. Uh, the draft minutes uh, from last week's meeting is at page six of your packs. Uh, members okay to agree those minutes? Great. And uh, I'll sign them. I think I'm due back on Parliament Buildings on Tuesday, so I can sign them on Tuesday. Uh, Stella, because um, so, I'm not physically available to sign them because we're working virtual at the moment. Um, in terms of uh, matters rising, I uh, want to refer members to the memo from the track at page 15. Uh, members, will, uh, members will recall it was agreed at last week's meeting that we should invite key stakeholders to provide written evidence to the committee in advance of an oral briefing from the Climate Change Committee on the 4th of March on the issue of our contribution to net zero. And uh, members can take a few minutes there to look at the memo, or look over the memo. Um, uh, are, members, are members content with the, the list of stakeholders that have been identified to give written evidence to the committee and for letters to issue? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you have any further thoughts on that, you can uh, bring it up um, with Stella um, at a later stage. Um, are there any other uh, stakeholders that members want to add or are you content with what we have suggested here? Mm -hmm. Um, and sorry, could I, could I also get agreement that we add the department's response to the Climate Change Committee uh, as mm -hmm. concerned last week on this issue uh, to the committee's webpage? Would that be okay with you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Philip, you've indicated here on the um, on the members uh, group that you want to raise a matter in relation to uh, last week's under matters rising in relation to last week's last. In relation to last week, yep, chair. Um, thank, yeah. thank you very much. Well, yeah. I, I think it's important, uh, just given the evidence that we heard last week from the permanent secretary and the chief vet, uh, in relation to the decision that was taken by uh, both the minister and Mid East Antrim Council to withdraw staff from Larne Ports. I mean, I think it's clear that this decision warrants further uh, investigation and scrutiny. I mean, we, we now know from what we heard last week and other evidence. Uh, this week that the council uh, ignored, uh, the minister and the council both ignored the level of the threat assessment from the PSNI and, and came up with their own assessment. Uh, we know now that Edwin Putz, prior to making this decision, was in conversations uh, and taking advice from his DUP colleagues. Uh, and we also now know, thanks to uh, the intervention, interjection of the PSNI and the trade unions, that there was key information provided to Mid and East Antrim councillors by senior council officials uh, and the mayor that, that quite simply wasn't true. So, I mean, at a time when the DUP were under uh, political pressure as a result of their disasters Brexit position, the DUP made this decision. Uh, so I don't think anyone could be blamed for thinking after hearing all of what we have heard uh, and what has been reported, uh, that the decision to withdraw staff uh, was a calculated and concocted political decision uh, by a DUP minister and others. And given, Chair, what we now know uh, 
and heard from the RHA inquiry into how the DUP conduct their business when under pressure. I think that's a fair assumption to come up with. So, I mean, I would be asking and proposing that this committee uh, carry out an investigation into all the matters that led to uh, the minister making this decision to withdraw uh, workers from Larnport. Uh, you know, I think we should be calling the minister. Uh, we should be calling uh, senior department officials. We, we, we should be calling uh, officers from Middle East Antrim Council, the trade unions, uh, e- even the PSNA and others, uh, uh, and quizzing them on this. And we should be asking for all documentary evidence that that was at their disposal when they came up with this decision. So, I mean, I, I'd be proposing that this committee, uh, given the seriousness of this, uh, carries out its own investigation. Okay. Uh- John, Blair. John. Chair, uh, yeah, and thank you. Um, I was all, also going to, to raise issues under, under this today. Um, m- members, colleagues will be aware of the, the briefing given by, by the Permanent Secretary uh, at the meeting where we heard the evidence, and I think there are uh, three main issues arising from that. Now, I, I, I say all of this, of course, in the context that, that we and others the issue of threats against staff very seriously, but we have we have to deal with the facts that have emerged since those um, threats were still or alleged threats were still reported. We have to take into uh, consideration as well comments made by others in relation to these reported threats, including not least of all trade unions who, who have clarified a position um, uh, very clearly indeed, and also and also in relation to. Midney Standard Council at least asked for further information themselves as to how information was uh, gathered and reported to others. So the three the, the three main issues for me are the, the timeline as reported from conversations which took place on the thirty first of January and the first of February between the minister, the, the outgoing minister, and uh, the permanent secretary. Um, second one is um, based on those conversations uh, that, that took place. Um, who took a decision, who issued a directive, um, and whether or not that, that was a political decision. But it, it's uh, an issue that really does need to be clarified, that there were reports of um, that, that the minister had spoken to a senior council official, for example, um, and reports that, that someone had said that the police didn't have a full grasp of the information. Um, that, 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 that desperately needs total clarification. Um, and the, the final issue is um, the facts that were presented and how they were considered in relation to contact with Mid and East Anderson Council and also the mention of um, discussions with colleagues, who those colleagues were and what the discussions were about. And, and, and we need to know because it's a very serious issue. So I, I would absolutely support um, an inquiry into those issues. Okay, uh, Morris. Morris. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Chair. Chair, uh, I've, I've no no issues with uh, trying to find out details and trying to find out information. But I would I would like to caveat that by saying that any threat to any man, woman, or child of any any, any persuasion at any workforce must be taken serious, seriously. Whether they're valid or not, you must remember that you can't take a chance with people's lives and people's livelihoods if a threat has no substance. It has still been made, however it has been made. And you've got to protect people, no matter what the circumstances are. Yes, there's a lot of he said, she said about this. Uh, uh, I'm not in here and I'm not fully aware of the situation, etc., etc. But if a threat is made, to any, any member of staff or any organisation, it should be taken seriously. And we can't send out a message here from this committee that threats are not a serious matter, that you can't take a, a threat seriously unless you investigate it in full over a period of days and weeks. And the behaviour of the PSNI over this past month and weeks doesn't instill an awful lot of confidence in their fact-finding and uh, intelligence gathering, to be honest. So let's be careful. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Harry. Right. Okay, thank you, Chair. Just to recomment to say, I mean, that I believe really that early intervention is best. People and employees' safety, that's top priority. And any decision 
for the minister and department was taken to protect staff, and I'd be content with that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, William? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we did hear from the permanent secretary last week. Um, it seems that car registration numbers had been taken. There obviously was some level of threat. By removing the staff in the short term to ensure their safety had no absolute consequences whatsoever because um, goods and lorries were able to travel on the route without, without any impediment. So there was no consequences for this and, and it was sensible to ensure the safety of staff. And I think this committee, there's a bit of politics we've played here, of course, but we've seen that before. Okay, William Patsy. Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, I think uh, in the middle of all this, um, we have the the backward and forward about Brexit uh, and the silliness around that. But the last thing I certainly would want is that staff be drawn into some cynical game over Brexit and over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, the the threats, and William has referred to. Uh, uh, car registration numbers been taken. Apparently, those were taken from the BBC website and footage from the BBC. So let's step back from this. Paramount is staff safety. We all know that. But secondly, is calming this situation down um, because we don't want what is a perception of what may be a risk to become an actual risk by hyping and inflaming the situation further. But I would certainly support all methods that can be taken by this committee or other committees to establish the actual realities of the facts, actual facts, who did what, where and when, and that includes uh, the PSNI, obviously, who will determine the risk factor, what has been reported to them, what are the actualities on the ground, what facts and information they have, certainly Mid and East Antrim, because there seems to be even a situation there where um, risk assessments and evaluations weren't even presented to elected members, uh, which seems a rather unusual way to do things, that um, members on a council aren't even trusted. So which is that, that makes it even more bizarre. And then uh, finally, DERA, we need to establish the timeline of uh, facts there, what happened, who did what, where and when. Um, so um, over to us as a committee, I don't think anybody would dispute that we have to establish a fact line and uh, from that fact line we'll see just who was acting properly, cogently or in the best interests of others. Okay, um, thank you Patsy. Rosemary? Rosemary? Thank, thank, you, very, thank you very much. Yeah, uh -huh. It's just to say um, well, there's been a lot of talk over what has happened. I do think the first thing that one had to consider was the, was the safety of staff. And I do think that decision was taken with the greatest respect to everybody in the interest of the safety of staff. And those are your number one priority. And I think we should all be cognizant of that, that these decisions were made with the staff first and foremost in the minds of those that made the decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. And Claire? Thank you, Chair. Um, and absolutely think that all of us would be agreeing that the, the primary objective is to keep people and staff safe. Um, and I note, obviously, that staff are back at work and the checks have started again. But this really was a, a pretty much an international um, incident that happened. Uh, the, this news went global. There was a huge amount of attention on it. And we all know that the, the feelings and the rhetoric uh, and the politics around the protocol is still building. It's still there. And there is a lot that we maybe should be doing in order to learn from what just happened. Um, and if we are to, to take this issue on, because um, I know that the police are saying that there was no credible threat. Others thought that it was credible enough to remove staff from their, their workplace. Um, and we need to learn. But, you know, my main, my main concern is that we learn as much as possible to make sure that this does not happen again. And if any potential threat may rise again, um, that we have the staff and their safety front and centre and we learn as much as possible from how to handle this should it happen again. 
Thank you, sir. Philip, you're looking to come in on our point there, are you? Yeah, I, I just think it's, it's important because obviously, as everybody has said, the safety of staff has to be paramount uh, when, when we're making decisions and looking at all of this. But, and I think it's key, and I, I left out, you know, we should also be uh, asking officials from Belfast and Warren Point uh, to come up to, to present evidence because they were presented with the same evidence and come up with a different decision than Mid and East Antrim and... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, the, the DP minister. So, I mean, I, I think it is clear that, you know, some people looked at whatever evidence was given to them in a totally different way, and, and that's one of the things that we should be getting to the bottom of. Okay. William, you come back in there again? Okay, Mr. Chairman, I think we need to be careful that we don't hype this and, and create, create a problem when, the, you know, this looks to be resolved. They're back at work. Uh, I think the more we hype this up, I think it's it actually... It's dangerous, you know. It, it, it actually, those that will be involved in intimidation and that type of thing, the more this is hyped up, it, it, it plays into their hands, that's my view. Okay. Um, okay, I've no other members in the kit here. So uh, we have a proposal from Philip that we um, investigate into these issues and ask, um, ask some witnesses to provide evidence to look into the facts around us here um, to see what we can learn from it. So um, do we have a, a committee view on this here? Chair, if I could just say, um, I'd be, I don't think, as Patsy's word said, we don't need to help the situation, we need to calm things, so I don't think there's any call, but that's just my opinion, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Chair, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I'm in agreement. I think uh, we're we are raising something to a level. We're playing a bit of politics, the committee in this. It looks to me, and I think it's dangerous. Uh, those that are prepared to make sets and do this type of behaviour are probably be watching how we behave. Uh, I think uh, it's important that we act sensibly in this. But I don't support this proposal. Okay, John, 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 John Blair is indicated here on the message, Sir John. Yeah, Chairman, yeah, thank you. Just to respond to a couple of those points. Um, first of all, I, I don't think it's anything unusual at all about wanting to um, further uh, question uh, and investigate a uh, really quite serious and high, uh, report from the Permanent Secretary a week ago, uh, and all of us know the outworkings from that. Um, it's not unusual that uh, a committee of the uh, Assembly would want to know in detail who took the decision and um, on what advice and the detail of that advice um, on which the decision was taken. And also, because of um, other attention that has been paid to this, not at all unusual that we would want to totally clarify the discussion that took place between um, a government department um, that, that we scrutinise on uh, in this assembly and its contact with a local authority. On, on the issue of, of uh, be, being political about it, uh, I, I can say I haven't um, alleged at this stage that anybody took a political decision. So my, my, my questions uh, uh, and my request for more information is not based on politics, it's based on truth and finding truth. Okay. Um, thank you, John. Patsy? Yeah, Chair, just to, to um, I'm in the same vein as John there. All we want to do is establish the facts. Now, there are three elements to it. First is the PSNI. Second is Mid and East Anthem Council. And third is the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. We have direct oversight of the Department of uh, Agriculture and Rural Affairs, so it's well within our remit to request facts around a given situation, which is, as Claire rightly says, has gone international. Now, th there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. In fact, it's our duty. Um, uh, Mid and East Antrim, uh, just um, going into the process of things here, I'm wondering, is there an overlap there with the, the Infrastructure Committee? I don't know. Uh, Stella may be well able to guide us there about uh, local authorities and the remit and how they fall in terms of even calling uh, to the Department of Infrastructure. And then finally, the PSNI, that's, that's purely a matter for the Chief Constable and how the uh, committee chooses to write to the Chief Constable or indeed the, the policing board around this matter. Okay. 
Thank you, Patrick. And Philip, you want another point in there? Yeah, I mean, I, I just think it's important to rebuke uh, the comments about uh, making this political and hyping the situation. I mean, this situation was hyped whenever the minister made the decision uh, and Midnight Standard Council made the decision that they made. Uh, you know, it, it has attracted international news. So, I mean, this, this was hyped uh, whenever the decision was made. Uh, and as others have said, it is important that we get to the bottom of how and why that decision was made for the best interest of, of the safety of the staff at Larnport and elsewhere. Okay. Okay. Um, right. Uh, okay. Members of, of, of all have their, uh, made the positions very clear in this year. Um, we don't have um, a consensus uh, on in terms of moving forward with such a investigation. So I think we should m maybe to take a vote on it. Would that be uh, fair enough? Way to proceed. Um, okay, so Philip, um, Philip, F Philip has made, made a proposal that, that this committee carries out an investigation into the circumstances surrounding that decision. Could members indicate if they're in favour of that? Against? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm in favour of it. Okay. Hi. Um, Can I get uh, just to ask those in favour just to keep their hands up till I count them, please? Yeah. Declan. John, Claire, Patsy, thank you. And, okay, is that recorded, Stella? That's recorded, yes. And uh, uh, any members who are against the proposal? William, Barry, Morris, Rosemary, your hand up, are you abstaining? Yep. Hi, Rosemary. Thank you, Rosemary. Okay. Okay. So um, the committee is voted by a majority decision then to proceed with an investigation into the circumstances surrounding this decision at the ports. Um, Stella, is, would you be able to guide us on what the next steps would be in relation to that? Uh, of course, Chair I'm hoping that we can spot the way forward. Should we start, Stella? Do you want to call the session for five ten minutes so we can discuss a way forward? Yeah, that would be helpful. Remember, we can tell you that we have four sides and I think we can discuss a way forward. Aye, okay. Yeah. Okay. Can Rod Jackson bring us a ticket off the public? Rod Jackson, please. Stella? 30. Yeah. It's okay. In public now. Okay. Um, thank you, members. And um, as agreed during our, our brief uh, recess there, uh, Stella, the clerk, will come back with um, uh, terms of reference for this investigation. Uh, our, uh, and uh, a plan for a way forward at next week's uh, meeting. So uh, that's that matter. Um, we'll be raised again at next week with the term to reference and the plan for a way forward at next week's meeting. Okay, members, I'm going to move on now to item five in the agenda. It's oral evidence from the Department on the Budget uh, 21 22. Uh, there's a memo from uh, the clerk in the table papers and the Department uh, briefing. Uh, document is also in the table of papers. I want to take this opportunity to welcome by Starleaf, uh, David Reid, the Director of Finance, uh, L Linda Lowe, the Head of Financial Planning, and Roger Downing, the uh, Deputy Finance Director. I want to invite the officials to commence their briefing, and then obviously uh, members will want to ask some questions after you make the presentation. So you're, you're very welcome, um, David, Linda, and Roger. Thank you, Chair. Can I just check that you can see and hear me okay? Yes, David. That's great. Thank you. Um, Chair, thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on Deere's draft budget for 2021-22. Apologies for the lateness in submitting the papers to you, but hopefully you've had a chance to go through them. And uh, I will draw out some of the key points in my opening remarks. So starting with the main draft budget document, the Chancellor announced a one-year spending review on the 25th of November, and that is the basis upon which the executive has considered its draft budget. 
On 18th of January, DOF published a draft budget document for 21-22, which set out the Northern Ireland Executive's proposed spending plans across all departments, and that can be accessed on the DOF website. This contains high-level information for DERA. The paper we have provided in your briefing pack outlines the impact of the budget and our spending proposals in more detail and will help inform consultation responses. It will also be available on the DERA website. The purpose of the DERA document is to, provide a more is to provide more detail on the draft budget, and you'll note that it confirms an initial allocation on both capital and resource. I've outlined shortfalls in capital and resource, and DERA intends to press DOF for additional funding as part of the final budget process to take forward the important work the department is carrying out on green growth and the bovine TB eradication strategy in particular. Committee support by responding to DOF's consultation would therefore be most welcome. On resource, DERA has been allocated 544.2 million, and this includes welcome confirmation of 315.6 million gap replacement funding, 3.1 million fisheries replacement funding, and 18.8 .8 million for EU exit staff costs. In addition, we have also been advised that we will be allocated a further 10.9 million a year, and this will provide additional funding for protocol costs, including 7.1 million in staff costs, 2 million uh, to support strategic environment programs, and 1.8 million for TRIPSI. Whilst the department welcomes the allocations, there are 22.8 million in funding gaps, which we have outlined in the document. And these include 14.4 million in relation to the EU replacement funding, 5.1 million in relation to the EU fund for disease eradication, and 2.8 million in uh, EU exit staff costs. And there's also a shortfall of 0.5 million in relation to the strategic environment programs. Committee will be aware from recent briefing that DERA is extremely disappointed that EU replacement funding is 14.4 million short on what was promised in the manifesto commitment because of the way in which Treasury has netted off current RDP funding. This is exacerbated by the loss of the EU fund for disease eradication, which contributes to the cost of our TV program. And added together, this creates a shortfall for next year of 19.5 million and impacts our ability to explore new options and measures in a future Northern Ireland agricultural policy framework. We've identified a total staffing requirement of 175 to take forward our responsibilities arising from EU exit. This estimated cost uh, is, the, uh, is about 28.7 million, and the date the executive has agreed to reinstate 18.8 .8 million funding for these costs. And we've also been advised that a further 7.1 million from Treasury will be allocated to this later in the year. But that still leaves a potential shortfall of 2.8 million against our full requirement. And it's also important to note that none of this funding has been baselined. This funding is important to ensure that DERA has the resources it needs to take forward the suite of new responsibilities it has as a result of uh, EU exit, and they're outlined in your briefing pack. In addition to the funding gap, we also are managing pressures of 11.1 uh, million in five areas. These include the bovine TB eradication strategy, pay inflation, uh, a drop in carrier bag levy income, um, a 1.2 million shortfall in the environment fund and also a shortfall in relation to operational costs. And again, details on these uh, pressures are set out in your briefing document. On resource, we have a concern regarding the overall shortfall of 33.9 million. We will continue to engage with DOF to secure additional funding as part of the final budget process for EU replacement funding, the environment and the bovine TB eradication strategy in particular. And again, just would welcome your support and responses to the consultation. On capital, the initial proposals for capital provide a net allocation of 95.5 million. And that funding would allow DERA uh, to take forward priority investment in programs of 48.1 million, IT systems of 21.6 million, estate transformation 3.8 million, and research and development of 22 million. When you add to this the 35 million that we hope to be able to draw down from the RDP, fisheries, and interreg programs, that takes the total capital requirement uh, in the department for next year to 130.5 million. The proposed capital allocations are outlined in the budget document in more detail, but generally we believe that our capital program is fairly ambitious and offers a lot to rural communities, the economy and the environment. 
while Stira has been successful in securing 95.5 million, which will leave her in a further 35 million from the EU, we believe more funding uh, could help enhance the allocations to green growth foundation programs, estate transformation, and recurring capital in particular. The department will continue to engage with DOF to secure additional funding as part of the final budget process. And again, we would welcome your support in response to DOF's consultation. On equality, the uh, Department's Equality and Human Rights Screening Template has also been completed in relation to the draft uh, budget proposals, and this is set out in the second document that we've provided in your briefing pack. Chair, that concludes my opening remarks, and my colleagues and I are now happy to take any questions that the committee might have. Uh, thank you for that, David. Um, I think it's the third week we've had you at the committee in a row, is it? So, uh, thank yeah, you very feeling much. Like a, <laughs> feeling like a regular fixture at this stage, Chair. <laughs> oh, no, we're not complaining, so not. We're, we're, we appreciate you uh, coming here with uh, with, with, the, with uh, providing so, so, important, so much important information. Um, David, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, there was a, I just was looking through the the um, the notes uh, that, that were provided to yourselves, to, to ourselves, from yourselves. Um, and it just relates um, in terms of the what we're losing to as a result of as consequence of Brexit. There's 5.1 million TV, 14 million for uh, well, actually uh, over the number of years, about 34 million in terms of the uh, rural development replacement. Can you tell me, is, is there any? Um, I know it was envisaged that replace replacement funding that was lost as a result of Brexit was replaced by the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. Has there, has there been any information at all or any progress made um, on the UK Shared Prosperity Fund? Because that's obviously the the fund that was held up as would be the, the replacement for what we, we, we are losing as a consequence of Brexit. Sorry, could I just uh, check, uh, Roger, do you have any information on that? I think uh, the uh, the Westminster Department, I mean, it's CLG, is taking the lead in it, and uh, both ourselves and DOF have been engaging with them to try and get more information as to as to how this will be taken forward uh, in the uh, in here and also in the devolved administrations. But there's no clarity on that yet, so we're still we're still pressing for more information, but but we we haven't got that at this stage. So that there's no no uh, information as yet on the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. Not 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 as part of this draft budget document. No. Yeah. The uh, other thing I want to ask you about was I note also in the document the Rural Business and Community Fund. Um, Two million was allocated to the Rural Business and Community Fund, and this is uh, effectively a replacement to the leader priority six of the Rural Development Program. Um, now. You will know that the, the leader priority six of the rural development program in the last uh, multi-annual round was 80 million. Um, but this rural business community fund, which is highlighted as a potential replacement, is sitting with a fund of 2 million. Um, and that's not withstanding the fact that we've been met at 34 million uh, um, by the British Treasury. They're not letting us mm -hmm. also roll that over. How... That's a, a huge differential. Have you any concern about the impact that they have for rural development? And even where, where is our rural policy at the minute that was supposed to be at the consultation in the autumn time last year? Yeah, I, um, at this stage, Chair, just uh, I suppose I, I could provide a buddy an update on that in terms of uh, for the for for the next year we've included, I think, across resource and capital. Um, about 12.7 million in relation to leader, and in addition to that, I think just reflecting on where we're at with uh, rural businesses and communities, and uh, the, 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 the over 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 the period of the rural development program over the past 30 years, there has been a lot of support provided, and uh, I think the department agrees that it's important that that's provided in the future as well. And planning for Brexit, the department is developing a rural policy framework, um, and this has been taken forward since June 2019 through a number of working groups. Um, I think there were five in total on tourism, innovation and entrepreneurship, training and skills, connectivity, social inclusion, health and wellbeing. Um, COVID has had an impact in terms of slowing the development of the rural policy framework, but it has created the chance to test assumptions through a number of pilots, and these include the Rural Micro Business Growth Scheme, Web Development Scheme, Rural Tourism Collaborative Experience Program, 
and Rural Social Economy Investment Scheme. Mm -hmm. The first draft of the Rural Policy Framework has nearly been completed, and once evidence from those pilot, pilot schemes is incorporated, I think the aim is to launch a consultation, and the next stage will then be developing the replacement for leader in rural tourism, which will be the Rural Business and Community Investment Program. So the new Rural, rural Policy Framework um, will align the five themes um, in the working groups in terms of rural tourism, innovation and entrepreneurship, health and well-being for rural dwellers, um, increased employment opportunities and improved connectivity between rural and urban areas. But we're not yet in the position to say how these future schemes will be delivered or what level of funding as we still have a consultation and budget and processes to go through in relation to that. And just to be clear, there, you know, I understood that, that and uh, I've been writing to the Minister in question, but the, wh why is this not open for consultation? Why is the rural policy, I know we're veering slightly off finance, why is that rural policy not open for public consultation yet? You know, that, that was something that we expected open before Christmas. Yeah, as I say, Chair, the information that I have on it is that um, it has been delayed as a result of uh, COVID. But I understand from engagement with the business area that the first draft of the policy has nearly been completed. Um, so, I mean, I can take a question back and pick that up with the business area um, mm -hmm. if it helps. But I'm afraid I don't have any further information beyond that at this stage. Yeah. And just the final thing for my members is um, the the trip side. You know, we've seen the huge importance of the tax and rural poverty social isolation um, um, initiative program over the course of the pandemic there and most recently a very welcome um, joint initiative with the Department of Infrastructure around the um, funding the trips to the vaccination centres for people um, uh, which was a, a great initiative and we've seen that Tripsy been used very effectively during the course of the pandemic and for supporting rural groups and all of the things that they did to fight this year but I note that um, the funding hasn't been baseline and hasn't been allocated into the draft budget. Um, you know, what, 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 are you confident this fund will be forthcoming? And, you know, obviously, I think we all know, as, especially those who are right in the areas, the potential implications of uh, any diminution to the attack on rural poverty social isolation pro program. Yeah, I mean, sure, it has been uh, it has been a concern for the department over the past um, couple of years that uh, funding for trips on resource hasn't been baselined, and we have been pressing and pushing uh, the OF to, to try and get that 1.8 million baselined. Um, we do have some certainty around. Uh, Tripsy for next year, and we are um, confident that we will receive the 1.8 million in 21-22. Um, and then, for the from the department's point of view, because of the importance of Tripsy um, and the impact that the funding has in rural communities, um, we would be pushing as part of the next CSR period, um, as part of the next CSR budget process, which we expect to launch at some point uh, this year. They try and have Tripsy baseline going forward, but it has been a concern. Um, and continues to be a concern that um, the Tripsy budget is basically agreed on a, a, a year uh, a yearly basis as opposed to having a baseline in our budget. Well, um, well, I just want to make just the point that if there's ever an example of um, a, li a little or a relatively little amount going a long way, the yep. Tripsy program is a really, really good example out there, particularly the way the, the programs that were used to tackle isolation and reach out to people in the most isolated areas during this pandemic is it's a shining example of the importance of that program to uh, community health and wellbeing. Um, yeah, and Chair, if I, if I could just add that as well, Chair, in terms of um, how we used the Tripsy Fund last year, we obviously we increased the allocations to Tripsy um, to help uh, deal with some of the effects of the pandemic, so if opportunities like that exist, we'll also consider those two budget process and three monitoring rounds. Perfect, thank you. Um, Harry, Harry Harvey, Harry, Harry, can you hear me, Chair? Yes, Harry, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much, and thank you, David, Linda, and Roger. Appreciate it. Um, on the far track, I'd just like to ask you your 3.4 million program well it, it references the woodland creation and this is to help landowners plant native woodland i'm just wondering how much of the 3.4 will be used in 21 for planting native woodlands 
and is this counted in the 15.6 million allocated to the green growth? No, this this uh, this funding is separate from green growth. So the capital allocation in relation to forestry, the 3.4 million, is part of the RDP, um, and it's our intention to spend out that funding in the in the next year. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, hi, Claire. Claire. Yes, Claire. Claire, I think you're on mute. You might need to unmute yourself. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, right and clear. <laughs> You'd be glad, would you? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. Can I just ask, um, wh why was there such a delay in getting this? We only got sight of this um, quite late on yesterday. What, what was the delay in getting these papers to the committee? Yeah, there were um, there were a couple of um, things that impacted on it. Firstly, uh, typically whenever we would go through a budget process, we would get earlier announcements um, of the spending review from uh, or the spending review allocations from Treasury. Whereas this year it was like the end of November, so we had a process to go through internally in the department and then engagement with the minister in terms of again or agreeing what the uh, what, what the budget allocations would be or how they would be. Um, spread out across the department for the next year. So we had gone through a process with Minister Putz, but Minister Putz hadn't had the opportunity to uh, clear the budget before um, before he had to leave as a result of all health. So when Minister Lyons came in, we had to take a, a bit of time and give Minister Lyons an opportunity to uh, go through the allocations and basically ensure that they aligned with his priorities for the next year. So as, as I say, as I said at the outset, like I am um, sorry for the delay in getting the information to you, um, but it's basically been unavoidable this year because of a, a number of factors. Well, can I ask, is there any indication about the funding priorities um, from the Minister? You've changed, so Minister Pooks had a look at, um, now we have Minister Lyons. Um, are their funding priorities the same for both Ministers? Um, they, they they are broadly the same as far as I'm, as far as I'm aware there was um, whenever we basically agreed the, the the process or when we agreed the allocations with Minister Lyons last week they broadly aligned with the uh, the priorities that would have been there for Minister Putz as well and do we know what those priorities are um, in terms of the budget proposals, um, I think probably uh, it's worth reflecting in particular uh, on the capital proposals. Um, the both um, ministers have uh, have been uh, very keen to ensure that there is um, a significant of, uh, amount of attention given the green issues, and that's reflected in the green growth al uh, allocations. And we know then that there is also. Um required to undertake a whole range of new roles uh, as powers are transferred from the EU. Um, mm -hmm. Can we look at a wee bit of that as well? Um, and I know that the executive had agreed to reinstate it was 18.8 .8 million non-baseline funding um, and that this has not been formally allocated at a draft budget stage. Um, can, can, can I ask what that will be used for uh, and why it has not been included in the baseline? The 18 point, uh, the 18, uh Point eight million and the seven point one million that we're getting from Treasury um, has been allocated to basically allow the department to take forward um, responsibilities that would that would now be devolved as a result of um, exit from the EU. So these are previously matters that wouldn't uh, wouldn't have been devolved to the same extent. So basically, we're now responsible for taking forward um, significant role in relation to agricultural policy, the environment, um, fisheries. Um, and, and uh, in terms of the funding that's there, that funding is basically primarily aimed at uh, staff costs at this stage. So I've highlighted in the uh, in, in the briefing that we have a requirement for 475 staff to take that work forward. So there's a, a fairly significant um, amount of policy work that has to be done. There's a fairly significant amount of work that now has to be done in relation to rural policy, agricultural policy, environmental policy, um, and that's what that, that's primarily what uh, what that funding is, is going to be geared towards. Is basically taking forward those those new work areas. 
grant, uh, and then the, there's further staff costs are required then to manage the, the work supports as well. So mm -hmm. these these are being managed separately. Then, but no, but can I I'm maybe ask you about how much funding is necessary for that work and how many staff that would represent on the ground as well? Um, and is this baselined or not? I don't think it is baselined, but correct me please if I'm wrong. Um, the the funding for the um, SPS checks at the ports and the work that the department has taken forward at the ports is being funded separately and through a separate process and through a separate exercise with Treasury. Um, I don't have the figures for that in front of me, but I can I can come back to you on it. Okay, see the staff that are working at the ports at the minute, are they being funded by DERA or are they coming from council budgets? Um, in terms of uh, in terms of the DERA staff, um, the DERA staff are being funded by the funding that will be drawn down from Treasury. There's like a, a separate business case and approval process um, that was uh, carried out. Uh, they secure additional funding from Treasury, and we get confirmation from Treasury that uh, Treasury will be funding any work associated with the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol and that funding will be provided separately. So, I mean, in terms of the uh, whether or not that funds council staff or not, I'm not entirely sure. As I say, um, it's outside the, the uh, budget 21-22 process and I'm here to brief on today, so don't have exact figures um, around that. Um, or I can't really advise beyond that process, but I'm happy to take that away and come back with a, with a further answer. Okay, thank you. Just a bit, um, I want to look at climate change and our mitigation works there as well. Um, is there any indication of how much of the total resource um, and capital is allocated to climate change um, and, and whether that's in the, the ministerial priorities and how much of that um, potentially will be allocated to staffing or the programme costs and what type of programme costs have been identified? Well, firstly, in terms of, um, I suppose, looking at capital, you'll see uh, we have a, an allocation of 15.6 million in relation to the Green Growth Foundation programs. Um, and that's money that's basically been set aside and it's aimed at driving forward and supporting our green growth strategy. Now, proposals are, are very much in development stage at, that, at the minute and further briefing will be provided in due course, um, but it's not an insignificant amount of money. On top of that, I think uh, when you add that additional funding to other areas, um, I think it will complement a fairly extensive investment in green issues in the department when you place it alongside things like FUBIS at 15.7 million, EFS, which is um, about 5.9 million resource, 5.6 million capital, forestry, where we're allocating 0.7 million resource, 3.4 million capital, and direct 6.6 .6 million capital, household waste, 3.5 million capital, and climate change R&D, 1 million. And as far as I'm aware, those funds, which uh, I think come to somewhere in the region of around 60 million, are not um, directly funding staff costs in the department. So on top of that, you will also have a number of staff in the department engaged in taking that important work forward. So from the department's point of view, there is a significant amount of work and a significant, a significant amount of um, effort at this stage basically taking forward um, green issues and basically ensuring appropriate investment. But a, another thing as well worth pointing out too, I suppose, is in relation to the green growth strategy as it develops, um, we will look at all our opportunities to invest and also look at opportunities to collaborate with all our departments um, to tackle these uh, very important issues. Okay. Any indication when we're going to get at the site of the green growth strategy? Um, I know it's currently in development, but I don't have I don't have a, a timetable. But I know it's something that um, that we're, we're we're taking forward as a matter of urgency. Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, uh, Rosemary. Rosemary. Okay, yes. Uh huh. Um, I just want to ask a question around the Office of Environmental Protection. Um, it's anticipated that DERA will provide funding for this Office of Environmental Protection uh, as it starts to deliver its remit within this jurisdiction. Can you tell me how much has been allocated to it and when it's actually, when you expect it to be up and running, etc.? 
Uh, Roger, do you want to take that one? Uh, my understanding the, the Assembly has given its consent to extend the provisions of the UK Environment Bill, giving um, effect to an Office for Environmental Protection, or OEP, to Northern Ireland, and the Department recently issued a discussion mm -hmm. document to gauge um, stakeholder views on how it should deal with the environmental plans, principles and governance in the future. And this consultation issued on the 10th of December and has, has recently been extended to the, the 26th of February. Um, I, I understand that uh, the previous minister committed to considering the implications of the NDNA proposal for the establishment of the uh, Environmental Protection Agency as part of a future uh, programme for government. Um, but uh, creating an organisation like this uh, is, is not easily done overnight and uh, consideration needs to be given to appropriate options and these will all require robust economic appraisals to determine uh, the best option for Northern Ireland. So there's 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 a lot of things that need to be taken into account, account including significant legislative, financial and human resource issues, uh, which would be necessary before decisions can be made. So I suppose at this stage, there's nothing directly allocated within the draft budget for that, but that's, that's something that, that can be kept under review as we, as we go through uh, the coming months. Okay, Rosemary. Well, surely as you, as you're, yeah, as you invest, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. As you investigate and are looking at this, surely you need to have some funding towards it. Uh, well, I suppose there is there. There's still um, a lot of staff within uh, EMFG and NIEA, and um, so those um, staff uh, will be looking at the options around it. So. Uh, if there's there's no direct bid at the minute for additional staff, um, because I, I presume some staff uh, that uh, may may move to the new organisation if they're um, doing similar roles. But as I say, it's it's very early. Um, there's significant um, financial and human resource um, implications need to be worked through before uh, that, uh, you know there's there's clarity around that. So. Um, and, and at this stage, there's no, there's no direct funding for it. But you know, if a if a pressure comes up, we can look to reprioritize during the year, then your monitoring round, or indeed bid uh, to the executive for additional funding at that stage. But it it, ha it hasn't been flagged up uh, as a pressure from the the business areas to us, and that's that's why you don't see it as a as a funding gap in any of the tables in the in the briefing pack that we've we've provided. Okay, thank you. Um, in relation to the funding for the eradication of bovine TV, uh, TB, um, that funding has been cut as we've as we've spoken about earlier. Um, do what do you see as what will the drawbacks be for the funding being cut in relation to this eradication program? In terms of the 5.1 million um, that we haven't had uh, reinstated, yeah. Uh, yep. Okay. Well, yep. the, the drawbacks there is it basically does give us um, a, a challenge in terms of an additional pressure that we have to manage. But typically, our TV costs were running at about 40 million a year, and I think in the current year they're somewhere in the region of about 37 million a year. Um, so there, there has been a bit of an easement there, which kind of reduces the overall uh, pressure. So that's one way in which we would we would try to manage it. Additionally, in terms of how we progress through the year, we'll monitor TB costs um, closely, and where uh, we we see that pressure materialize, and we'll engage with DOF um, in order to try and secure additional funds or reprioritize um, within the department to ensure that the program is funded. So I mean, managing the TB program for the department is a it's a statutory responsibility um, and it's something that we basically simply have to do and, and have to fund so we will ensure that it is funded but it does give us a challenge in terms of how we manage through through the through the year ahead okay, okay. thank you okay. William yeah <clears throat> William? In, to, in, in relation to the green growth strategy and the moment TV eradication strategy you did say that you were present uh, Department of Finance for additional resources. How much are the additional resources do you reckon is required? 
in relation to the um, the eradication of uh, the, the I'll, the green growth yeah, growth. I'll I'll uh, I'll let Roger take that in terms of green growth. Um, the additional funding at this stage, we've we've obviously got a, a significant amount of funding on the capital side, and we're in the process of developing proposals uh, against that, which we hope to move forward with um, in, in the in the year ahead. But as those proposals develop, um, our hope is that it will um, generate additional programs that we'll be able to take forward. And basically, as we go through monitoring rounds and refine that, we'll basically work with the Department of Finance to try and secure additional funding. But at this stage, we don't have an exact figure in our head. Okay, okay well, um, uh, Morris? Morris? Right, sorry, sorry, Chair. You okay, Morris? Go ahead. Yep, yep. Uh, thank you, Chair. Chair, I was just wondering, we were talking earlier this morning about the, the, the ports, and I was wondering, uh, staffing costs have already been discussed, but what cost, if any, falls to the department to cover council staff working at the ports, or is the cost picked up through the council budget? Um, I Again, because the SPS um, process or the, the costs in relation to the SPS process haven't been something we've been considering as part of this budget process. Um, I don't have the figures in front of me in terms of what the financial implications are for the work at the ports, and I can come back on that because it is part of a, a, a separate process. But mm -hmm. my understanding is that all the additional costs um, arising from the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, we have agreement with Treasury that they will all be funded by Treasury. So any additional costs arising out of that work will be picked up by Treasury. So I'm making the assumption, but I would need to confirm, I'm making the assumption that um, additional costs for the councils um, should probably be considered on there too. Okay. Just one more, Chair. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, the depart have the Department identified uh, any major challenges following on from Brexit and the imposition of the Northern Ireland Protocol? Uh, through the board, responsibility for fisheries, forest, agriculture and rural development, not to mention the important topic that has been discussed here of the environment and the protection of the environment. Has the Department worked out any extra costs in implementing all this uh, new devolved responsibilities? In terms of in terms of um, specific costs arising out of the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, again, there's the there's two sides to that. There's the SPS costs, and then there's um, non-SPS um, Northern Ireland Protocol costs. In terms of the funding that we've secured from Treasury for um, kind of wider um, policy work, we've been engaging very closely with Treasury through DOF, and as a result of that, we've secured an additional 7.1 million um, from Treasury, which is uh, helping the awards our overall Brexit staffing costs, and a further 2 million that we're using to take uh, to help take forward strate uh, strategic environment programs. So there's been an additional 9.1 million um, secured from Treasury in relation to that, and that's on top of additional funding that we're um, securing as a result of the SPS checks. Okay, that's that's fine. Thank you very much. That's me, Chair. Thank you. Um, okay, Morris. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much um, uh, again for answering both members' questions in great detail, and um, that was very, very much uh, app appreciated. So, um, yeah, uh, I want to thank you for attending this morning, David, uh, Linda, and Roger. Very appreciated, and. Um, Thank you very much, and no doubt we'll be seeing you in, in the time ahead. And uh, so thank you. So, uh, members, we will um, we will consider our response to this budget towards the end. Yes, David, sorry, did you say something there? No, nope. um, he's gone. Right, okay, good luck. Okay, well, we will uh, consider our response to the department's budget uh, at close session at the end of the, the meeting. So, uh, members, we're moving on now to item six on the agenda which is a supplementary legislative consent memorandum for the Environment Bill uh, to include an update on the bill and roll out of its provisions by DERA. I want to refer to the memo from the clerk at page 18 and papers from the department at page 33. I'd like to welcome by Starleaf, John Mills, Head of Environmental Policy Division, uh, Carl Beatty, Environmental Bill Team, and Head uh, the original officer, and I'd like to invite the officials to uh, 
brief the committee and members will indicate if the uh, winner, members will subsequently want to ask questions of you. So you're very welcome here from and, 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 and Stuart. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Chair. I hope committee members can hear me okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah. I'll cover the recent. Uh, I'll cover the recent delay to the Environment Bill and the uh, potential impact of that delay on Northern Ireland provisions. Um, you've also asked for an update on amendments made to the bill since the committee last considered it, and uh, Carl, Carl and Stuart will cover these. Um, we had hoped to brief you today on a draft supplementary legislative consent motion memorandum, and uh, we uh, regret that that's not possible. Um, I understand there may have been some uh, miscommunication regarding this, and we apologise for any inconvenience that may have caused. Unfortunately, there remain some procedural issues to iron out regarding a cross-cutting matter, and to that end, we're liaising with colleagues in the Department for the Economy and with DEFRA, uh, but we look forward to providing that briefing in due course. On the causes of delay to the bill, uh, the UK government uh, took the decision to seek Parliament's agreement, carry over the bill to the next session of Parliament, which is expected to commence in May. Parliament uh, agreed to that request and the bill was paused during its report stage on the 26th of January. Uh, the DEFRA minister has advised uh, the House of Commons that the UK government intends to complete the report stage as soon as possible in the new session. So that's in May when it comes back. Uh, while this is uh, undesirable, uh, we, we accept that it is due to procedural issues. Uh, in normal circumstances, uh, the bill would have completed its passage through Parliament during this uh, first session that we're currently in. Uh, because of the significant delay at committee stage due to COVID uh, restrictions and the high volume of legislation passing through Parliament towards the end of 2020 uh, concerning Brexit, a risk was identified by UK government that the bill may not complete all of the relevant parliamentary stages and receive royal assent before the opening of the second session, in which case the bill would have fallen and then it would have had to be introduced. And obviously that would have caused uh, even longer delay. Uh, the effect on the Northern Ireland provisions of the overall time frame being extended by five to six months is mixed. Uh, we've outlined these in the written briefing, so I won't go through them again in detail. In many areas, it will have no effect at all due to existing timescales for policy development, drafting of subordinate legislation, for example. So there's some quite long timescales for some items. In other cases, there is a potential impact which would be uh, realised if an urgent uh, need arose to amend existing legislation uh, through not having the enabling powers in the bill. Uh, for the core plans, principles and governance uh, provisions, we're not expecting significant impact on the environmental improvement plan as the environmental strategy will not be completed until later in the year. In the event the strategy is completed before the environment bill, there's no uh, legal reason for its publication to be delayed. There will, however, be obvious delays to the publication of an environmental principles policy statement um, and the establishment of the Office for Environmental Protection, neither of which can uh, come into law until after royal assent is granted and the Assembly approves commencement. Uh, as a result, uh, it's unavoidable that governance gaps will continue. Interim arrangements for the OEP have been put in place uh, through the Interim Environmental Governance Secretariat. It will continue as long as necessary with processes being refined uh, as more experience is gained in managing complaints. Uh, while not ideal, uh, the, OA, the OEP will be able to deal retrospectively with complaints received during this interim period. Uh, with regard to the amendments made to the bill, we've provided a list in the written briefing, most of which are relatively minor and technical. There are only two which uh, will be the subject of the supplementary uh, legislative consent motion. Uh, these are the powers for DEFRA to give guidance to the OEP in respect of specific matters and provisions on forest risk commodities and commercial activities. Uh, if you'd like us to do so, Carl and Stuart will be happy to explain 
those two areas, the OEP guidance and the forest risk commodities? Or if you prefer, we can go to questions now. That's yeah. me finished, Chair. Okay. Well, I suppose if members have questions relating to those amendments, it's they, they will pick them up during the question session, if that's okay with other members. Um, I suppose, John, one of the things I want to just pick up on before I move around uh, the room, uh, in, in the note, um, and you mentioned it there, that we have an interim arrangement of the IEGS, and the here is integrated into IEGS as far as practical to do so. Um, could you just elaborate on that there, that the North is integrated into the IEGS as far as practical to do so? Uh, what, what is the interface between here, Pindera, and the AEGS? Uh, um, you know, and, and, and could you just elaborate on that a little bit more, please? Uh, thanks, Chair. Carl, do you want to pick that up? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, the, the IEGS is, uh, is set up by uh, by DEFRA. Uh, it's, it's essentially a team with within DEFRA, but with information barriers. And um, the, uh, the 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 IEGS has in England has has two main roles. One is to uh, monitor uh, the implementation of the twenty five year plan on the environment. Um, and that is the the, the old uh, Natural Capital uh, Committee Secretariat that has 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 um, been moved into the IEGS. Um, so we have no involvement in that in that part of the IEGS's um, operation. Um, the bit that we are involved with is the complaints management system, um, which, um, given that we have this gap between the end of the transition period and the beginning uh, of the OEP operating. Um, the, we, we needed a facility for people to be able to um, uh, register their uh, their complaints, and those complaints are um, are collated and um, triaged uh, to to determine that they are uh, valid complaints um, that that come on that will come under the remit of the OEP, um, and the OEP uh, will then be able to deal with those as it sees fit whenever it comes into being. Um, in terms of uh, direct Northern Ireland involvement in that, um, we have a member of staff who is uh, uh, who works with the IEGS uh, approximately one day per week and um, has full access to the complaints management system and um, and, and is, is is fully integrated uh, into that team on a part time basis. Um, uh, uh, people uh, from uh, Northern Ireland can uh, complain through the the web portal that has been um, established um, for that, um, in, in the same way that uh, that uh, anyone in England can do. Okay, and uh, just um, just want to just again touch on the amendments again. The minister has indicated in relation to the two amendments that uh, that. Once the North to remain have parity with with Britain in respect to these amendments, could you just elaborate a little bit more on those two amendments again, please? Yeah, Sorry, I'll, uh, yeah, okay. On um, the the um, amendment twenty at uh, at report stage, which is the one on OEP guidance, um, and um, that's 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 the one OEP amendment that that falls outside the scope of the original um, legislative consent motion. Um, and this part enables uh, DERA to issue statutory guidance uh, to the OEP uh, on its enforcement policy, um, uh, which are a, a, a list of matters set out in, in Clause uh, 22.6 of the bill, um, so far as they relate to the OEP's Northern Ireland enforcement functions. Um, the, uh, the OEP will be required to have regard to the DERA guidance in preparing its Northern Ireland enforcement policy and in exercising its Northern Ireland enforcement functions. Uh, it's important to note that this part is only uh, intended to be used reactively, um, that is, in response to issues that may arise in practice in relation to the OEP's Northern Ireland enforcement policy. It's not intended to set the agenda for the OEP. Um, access to similar powers for the Secretary of State and DERA will help to ensure a consistent approach to environmental governance arrangements across both jurisdictions. Um, it has been suggested that this amendment erodes the independence of the OEP. Um, if, if it does, it is in a very limited way. 
Uh, firstly, the guidance does not bind the OEP where there's clear reasons not to follow it. Um, it is merely required to have regard to the guidance. And secondly, DERA must exercise the part in line with their duty to have regard to the need to protect the OEP's independence, um, which is in uh, paragraph 17 of Schedule 1. Um, we know from discussions with stakeholders that um, there are concerns around this particular amendment, and we understand those concerns. Um, however, taking all circumstances into account, we believe that this amendment is appropriate. Okay, that's Amendment 20. Amendment 20, in yeah. that report stage, yes. Uh, and then there was a second amendment as well. Uh, yes, that's for sure too. Yeah, Stuart, do you want to cover that? Uh, yes, uh, Chair, can you hear me? Yeah, Stuart. Uh, that, that's fine. Um, the the, uh, the new uh, uh, Schedule 16 of, of the Draft Environment Bill um, uh, provides for the uh, the DEFRA Secretary of State to make requirements uh, for the use of forest risk commodities in commercial use in, in the UK. And uh, this includes defining what these risk commodities are, um, prohibition of the uh, use of illegally produced uh, forest risk commodities in the UK, um, the establishment and implementation of a due diligence and reporting requirements by businesses using such forest risk commodities, um, introduction of enforcement powers through uh, secondary legislation following uh, consultation, and it also provides for a periodically reviewing um, the effectiveness of, of the provisions and publishing uh, that that review. And I, I think it might be worth just very briefly outlining the uh, the background um, to the, uh, the schedule. Um, uh, the UK um, uh, consumes a significant amount of co commodities, and these are the so-called forest risk commodities, uh, whose rapid expansion in use um, is associated with uh, global uh, deforestation, uh, often in, controversial, in contravention of, of local laws, and th this issue I note receives significant media scrutiny. Um, it uh, adds to uh, release of uh, carbon dioxide, uh, creating uh, uh, climate change, and also uh, generates uh, significant uh, loss in uh, biodiversity. The type of commodities include um, uh, products such as uh, uh, soy, uh, coca, palm oil, rubber, beef, and leather. Uh, many UK retail foods, cleaning products, and cosmetics rely on these commodities. So if one looks at the small print at the back, uh, one will see uh, a component of, of these. And I think it's fair to say that these uh, risk commodities are also embedded in other products. Uh, so uh, soya uh, is often a constituent of animal feed. And I suppose the whole purpose of the legislation uh, would make it uh, illegal for businesses to use in their supply chain, either in production or in trade within the UK, uh, forest risk commodities that have not been produced in compliance with applicable laws of the country in which they are grown. And certainly globally, uh, there is uh, uh, good evidence that a large proportion uh, of forest clearance to produce these these commodities is is not uh, considered legal. Um, businesses coming in uh, the scope of this legislation uh, would require to operate a system to meet the due diligence requirement, report on it, uh, so that they are ab able to demonstrate uh, compliance. Um, a UK-wide consultation on the use of forest risk commodities in commercial activity took place last November and indicated an overwhelming positive uh, uh, response uh, received uh, to, to these proposals. Um, and uh, since the power to regulate companies in Northern Ireland, which would be the basis of regulating these risk commodities as a competence of uh, the executive and assembly, um, it's for the executive and the assembly to consider this issue um, as part of uh, a legislative consent motion. Okay. Um, thank you, Stuart, for that answer. Uh, just before I move on to uh, John and Claire, you know, um, I just want to ask the question then, 
about the the cross border all island dimension to all this here, and and just even in relation to you know forests, you know, few situations where forests here, like even in my own, was just in Master Own, like Calder Forest, for example, you know, it it, it just it expands right into Donegal, you know, and this seems to be very much sort of like east west type of a. Um, amendment that we're talking about here. How does this amendment, and indeed the, the environment bill in general, fit in terms of our cross border? The fact we share the same island here uh, as another jurisdiction, which actually is in the EU, and we're technically out of the EU. Um, and where does all of that fit with the protocol? Uh, well, shall, shall I answer that uh, generally, and then um, Stuart, if you want to pick up particularly on the on the um, on 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 the forestry, um, well, in in general, the the there are there are both institutions. North South uh, Ministerial uh, Council, um, and uh, I, indeed uh, across all the jurisdictions on these islands through the British Irish Council, they continue that the, the um, a lot of the the withdrawal legislation specifically protects against uh, uh, against any um, weakening or interference with that and a, a, at a practical level the um, there's ongoing operational uh, uh, arrangements and meetings between um, between uh, various uh, uh, official level groups so uh, that that will all continue um, the protocol the effect on the protocol uh, with the environment bill is that uh, the, the the OEP and these governance arrangements affect all aspects of the environment. You've got to remember that the protocol only affects about 20 uh, specific environmental areas. Um, and the, the focus of those is, is on really the protection of the single market um, rather than environmental protection per se. And in the bill, there is provision for the um, the OEP to uh, um, have uh, discussions with uh, bodies outside um, the the UK that will that could have an impact. So again, that's obviously meant to be aimed at the European Commission and its continued oversight of some areas through the protocol. So those arrangements are are, are in place. They're not um, they're not damaged or undermined or weakened by what's in the bill. Stuart, do you want to say anything about forestry specifically? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, thanks, uh, uh, John. Um, uh, uh, the, the chair uh, makes uh, uh, a very good example in uh, Kalita uh, Forest uh, with uh, uh, Forest Service uh, managed woodland, uh, uh, which uh, is immediately adjacent to uh, Quilcher uh, managed uh, woodland uh, in, in in Ireland. Um, both uh, uh, the uh, the, the the marketing of uh, uh, round conifer logs, uh, which uh, result in uh, management of these forests uh, in both uh, Northern Ireland and in Ireland, um, are um, subject to uh, the timber regulations, uh, which requires them to be uh, legally. Uh, produced, uh, but in addition to to that, um, both uh, Forest Service and and Quilcher, um, are independent, independently certified um, as, and this is a voluntary um, uh, independent certification uh, that they produce their. Uh, timber not only legally but sustainably uh, and uh, for both organizations uh, it is key uh, for um, uh, both Quilcher and ourselves in marketing the, um, uh, the wood products uh, to the uh, processing plants and then the processing plants supplying that to the retailer. Uh, so you may notice uh, when you purchase um, some thorn timber uh, in uh, 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 
uh, one of the large uh, distributors or indeed in a local yard. Um, it will have uh, Forest Stewardship Council or FSC um, certified uh, mark on it. And this demonstrates uh, that it is um, uh, both legal and sustainable. And I suppose that's where um, uh, the issue of the amendment to the uh, uh, this uh, Schedule 16 of the draft environment bill is trying to uh, introduce um, in in that case um, a case of uh, um, these risk commodities being produced um, uh, in uh, in um, overseas uh, to to ensure that they are at least uh, legally uh, legally produced. So t t timber, I have to say, is a good example where already uh, the mechanisms are in place. Uh, that it is legally produced and uh, certainly on the island of Ireland um, uh, the the major producers also uh, have voluntary certification indicating that it's sustainably produced. So just just to be clear then so that article 16 amendment that we're talking about wouldn't shouldn't result in any differentiation of the management of forests such as Kalitar which uh, whatever about the uh, jurisdiction, it's all in the one island of Ireland um, and in the one territory, um, it shouldn't create any differentiation. No, it's very, Chair, it's very, very unlikely that um, uh, timber uh, will be uh, uh, identified as a risk uh, commodity uh, simply on the basis uh, that there is already legislation in, in place uh, uh, both um, uh, north and south, uh, to uh, to cover um, uh, to cover the legality of its um, harvesting, uh, and uh, in addition, voluntary uh, means to ensure sustainability. Thank you, Stuart. I'm going to move on ahead around the room here to Claire. Claire Billy, Claire. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, Claire. Thank you. Um, I want to look at this new clause two um, in the bill. Um, and looking at it, clause two would end the requirement for authorities to assess the impacts of a project on SACs and our SPAs. Um, and these are duties just that have been in place since 1992 under the EU Habitats Directive. Um, and the removal of those duties would then further expose the huge network of irreplaceable habitats to, to damage in development. So my concern here is that the ending of these legal duties would not only represent a real major change to planning, but also would be non-compliance with international law. Um, are you concerned that it would mark a regression of current environmental requirements? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, new clause two? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that new clause two applies in Northern Ireland. Well, that would be good news. <laughs> um, I, I, it's it's it's, um, it's not it's not one that is f familiar uh, to me. Was this in um, committee stage or in? Yeah. But I was looking at that, sorry, I'll go on because the concern then was tying that if it's not applicable um, in Northern Ireland, that would be good. We are looking at that in with the government's amendment 20. Again, I'll go back to that one. So if that passed, um, and now you're saying that the amendment 20 is not intended to set the agenda, but simply to be a reactive um, measure. So if I'm looking at in particular well, we know that there are environmental problems here in Northern Ireland, and I'll go and use the ammonia issue as, as an example here. So, for example, we know that in our currently in our spas and our sacks that we are breaching um, the EU directive by you know three, three, four, three hundred percent year on year on year. And now, when SES tried to change the critical level to one percent for planning approval. Then what we had was the minister then had um, written to the mid East Antrim Council and confirmed that the Environment Agency critical level of between 1 and 10 should be used. But this doesn't take account of the levels in the area as a whole. 
So if we are looking at passing um, Amendment 20 and the Minister, uh, and so if the OEP must have regard then to you know, the, the advice coming from the Minister, how can we get sort of real good proper protections under circumstances like that that we have currently in place in Northern Ireland? Okay, well, I mean, firstly, the, um, the, the, the guidance only applies to a, uh, a, a specific uh, range of provisions, which are, are those in uh, 22.6 of, uh, of, of the bill. Um, and those are the uh, those are the items that are that must be included in the OEP's enforcement policy. So that those those items are, um, you know, how the OEP intends to determine whether failure to comply with environmental law are serious, um, how it intends to determine whether damage uh, to natural environment or human uh, health is serious, um, how the OEP intends to exercise its enforcement functions in a way that respects the integrity of other regimes. Um, how the OEP intends to avoid any overlap between the exercise of its functions and how the OEP intends to prioritise cases. So the guidance can only be issued in respect of those specific items, uh, both the preparation of that enforcement policy and the implementation of it. Um, and uh, in, in, in terms of uh, the OEP having regard to it, I mean, it is simply that it must have regard to it. But if it has a good reason not to, to apply that guidance, it, it is perfectly within its uh, rights to do so. Um, so it's it's you know it's it's absolutely not giving the the dear minister um, you know carte blanche uh, or or the deference secretary state carte blanche to uh, to dictate what the the OEP does. It, it simply cannot do that. Um, it simply is providing guidance, and the intention is that that would only be if. Uh, something were to happen that that you know the OEP's enforcement policy was significantly you know out of whack with with what um, you know what would be expected what would be normal um, you know what it's trying uh, what what it's set up to achieve uh, that's the intention behind it um, and that is noted in the delegated powers memorandum that it is intended to be a responsive measure. Does the department does the minister have the powers at the minute to reclassify? Um, our special areas of conservation and our spas as well? Uh, that's not a question I can answer, I'm afraid. It's outside my area of, uh, of, okay. of expertise. It wouldn't be in the bill, Carl. There's nothing in the bill. Whether, well, whether certainly, it's, not the, it's certainly not in the bill, but whether existing legislation, I'm just, I, I really don't yeah. know. Oh, okay, then. Thank you. Uh, John, John Blair. John? Yep, I'm sure you hear me okay, yeah. We got you, John. I um, think that so, some of what I was going to, to cover has already been um, asked by, by Claire, but I just want to go a bit further on the OEP following of um, STERA guidelines and um, perhaps reflect on, surely that means immediately that if, and, and I think Carl said there, if, if they would have to be working within the confines of what is expected, then surely that means it's going to be much more difficult to make environmental pr improvements, um, especially those that might be directed by the OEP. And therefore, uh, that, that presents a challenge in itself. Um, you've covered some of what I was going to ask already, uh, Carl, but I'm concerned that there, there, there'd be a lack of um, improving standards or um, higher bar being set if what we're going to do is what is expected. I assume that means what we do already rather than making improvements in the future. Are you with me? Yes, sorry, sorry. Clumsy language on my part, I'm afraid. Um, and when I, when, I, when I say what is expected, what, what I mean is that, you know, essentially it's, it, it's intended as a means of um, uh, correcting a situation where the OEP has gone, you know, off on a tangent, um, if, if you like. Um, uh, it's not, a, 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 you know, the intention is absolutely not for the department to set what the, the OEP's um, uh, role is or what the OEP's, well, it's certainly what the, the role is, but, but not what the, the OEP's um, ambitions should be. Um, the OEP will be an independent body um, and it will be um, free to, uh, to, to uh, act as it sees fit within the constraints of the legislation. 
And it's worth saying, Carl, that, that, you know, in terms of the whole structure, the department has got to uh, produce an environmental improvement plan. So it is a, an improvement plan and the, the OEP will, will assess that plan, uh, uh, to, including to see how they're improving the environment. And that, that, that gets um, reported by, on, by the OEP annually. It gets laid in the assembly. The department is obliged to, um, to respond to any uh, recommendations that the OEP makes and to um, and, and to lay that in the assembly as well. So there'll be a very transparent process around improving the environment um, and uh, with legal requirements for, for department to respond. And ultimately, if the OEP concluded that the uh, any public body's uh, 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 compliance with, with environmental law was so so awry, it can take enforcement action against them. So I think there is a recognition of improvement there. Okay, yeah, John, think... thanks for that. And, and we, we can assess this as we go forward and as this continues to make its way through uh, Parliament as well. But it's something I'm sure myself and other members will be paying particular attention to as you will go. Sure. John, thank you. Uh, Rosemary? 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 Okay, thank you. you hear me? Um, just, ahead, I heard. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Rosemary, we can got you. Hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Chair, I did hear you mention something about protocol, and then sort of I'm, I lost a lost signal or whatever. Um, can you? And I'm not sure maybe my question's been answered, but it's just just ask you know, the outworkings of this bill will result with Northern Ireland remaining under some EU legislation, I presume. So what impact will the Northern Ireland protocol have on it? You pick that up there, did you? Hello. Um. Yeah, I'm, yeah I'm sure. I think I think I think John has uh, has frozen um, there. Um, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, could you possibly repeat the question, please? Rosemary, can you repeat that there? Yeah. Yes. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes, Rosemary. Um, you know, sort of the out, the outworkings of this bill will result with Northern Ireland remaining under some EU legislation, and what impact would this have in the Northern Ireland Protocol? Uh, yes, I mean, we, we expect... Uh, or what fairly, impact is the Northern Ireland yeah. Protocol? Yeah, we expect a fair, fairly limited um, impact from the Protocol. Um, as, as John mentioned earlier, um, you know, there, there is a, a, a limited amount of um, environmental legislation that is um, actually listed in, um, in Annex 2. Um, so there, um, and, and in terms of the the bill, uh, the only uh, specific uh, provision in the um, in the bill uh, that is covered in Annex Two of the Protocol is the uh, the REACH regulation the, and on chemicals. Um, so it is uh, in, in, on on chemicals. Um, Northern Ireland uh, is required to uh, comply with EU REACH as opposed to UK REACH um, going forward. Um, uh, but you know, it, it's it's not. Um, it, 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 initially, it, it, it won't have any impact at all if, in the future, there's some sort of divergence between um, EU reach and UK reach. And then Northern Ireland would uh, would follow EU reach. Okay, Rosemary. Okay. Okay, uh, Morris. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Morris. Yeah, Chair, can you hear me? Yes, Morris, I got you. Uh, Chair, uh, some of the media coverage surrounding the environmental bill across the water uh, suggests that the OE OEP will not have the teeth it needs to make sure the environmental regulations and protections are adhered to. Uh, in my area over the years, uh, some pollution incidents have occurred through government departments. Does the, the OEP uh, enable the ability to fine the government or government bodies if they breach their responsibilities? Uh, 
Schedule 3 Amendments 9020 suggest to me that there are a lot of grey areas. The word, the word may is used quite a lot in regards to environmental protection. To me, may is a weak word that easily transposes to may not. Uh, surely this negates enforcement action to be dependent on the polluter, who the polluter is and who is in breach of environmental protections. Do you think the word may could be replaced by the word will? It's still too open-ended for me. Oh, okay. The um, first of all, on the on in terms of specific environmental, um, say um, uh, offences or, or, or incidents, we've got to remember that the o, the OEP is the high level body overseeing other public bodies, making sure they do their job. So it's not going to be involved in the direct enforcement of. Um, of environmental law, the direct regulation. That is a matter for the environmental regulator, which is the Northern Ireland Environment Agency and various other bodies in, in other areas. And there'll be various um, powers, uh, including criminal sanctions for, um, for, for dealing with, with, with specific incidents. And the OEP will be more about, um, uh, I think, as you said, uh, more about um, making sure that organizations like the Northern Ireland Environment Agency actually do do their job. Okay, Morris. Any action the OEP might might be in a position to take action. So uh, the, the, the OEP will will, will 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 maintain that oversight. On on the specific um, issue of uh, the May, I, I didn't catch the particular provision. Did you Carl? Um, sorry, not 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 entirely. Um, I'm afraid the room has been a little bit difficult today. Morris, do you want to repeat that a bit? The may or will? I, uh, chair, it, it's a lot of the, the, the in Schedule Three. A lot of the amendments uh, use the word may, uh, may may take action, may not take action. Uh, to me, may is a weak word, and I would like to see may replaced by will will take action, not may take action, because may means they may not. It's a small word, but it, it, it has uh, very typical outworkings. Um, I think we'd have to come back on, on, on the specific issues of that. I mean, the, the, the OE, just as a general comment, the OE is independent. So um, if you say may, it allows it discretion. To, to make its own judgments. If you if you say it must do this and it must do that, then that's kind of like government dictating. Um, so that may be one answer, but we'd need to look at the specific provisions. Um, one thing uh, that we, we, we uh, are aware of if, if on concerns about independence is that the, um, the chair designate of the OEP, uh, Dame Glynis Stacey, I know uh, in, in, in discussions is offered to um, brief the uh, the committee. So if the committee would find that useful uh, to hear, um, I, I hesitate to say from the horse's mouth, but to, to hear um, directly from 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 uh, Dame Glynis, I mean, I, I'm sure that can be arranged if the committee would find that helpful. Yeah, well, thanks very much, John. Uh, We'll see what happens, and I look forward to your answers. Um, you even send them to me in writing, I'd be happy enough. Chair, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, John and Carolyn Stewart, uh, I want to thank you for attending this morning and for your for your presentation and for uh, taking uh, all of the, the, the questions posed by the members. So thank you, and we will be seeing you again. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Chair. Thank you. Um, okay, okay, members. I'm going to move on now to item seven on the agenda today. Um, this relates to the independent uh, panel for review of decisions. And we were having um, uh, oral evidence from B. Little and J. O'Brien. And uh, I want to refer members to the uh, our papers, which have been supplied by the two witnesses at pages 46 to 244, and a memo from uh, the clerk at the PAC. Um, it's, a, it's in the pack, so it is. 
um, the um, the the item relates to work being undertaken by the committee on the independent panel for review of decisions for applicants to area-based schemes. Uh, member uh, will members will be aware that where an applicant considers a decision of the department to be incorrect, uh, that they can seek a review. Stage two of this process involves an independent panel. Um, a number of concerns have been raised by stakeholders and members in relation to this. The committee has taken oral evidence from DRO officials on this matter uh, on the 28th of January. And today we will hear from Mr. Brian Little and Mr. James O'Brien. A further oral uh, evidence session with the ACA and IAPA is scheduled for the 11th of March. Written evidence has also been sought from a number of stakeholders um, organizations. So, well, but welcome by Starleaf, uh, James O'Brien, uh, barrister, at, uh, barrister at Law, and also Brian Little, who is a voluntary advisor. So thank you, uh, gentlemen. You are very, very welcome. And can I ask the witnesses to take up to uh, 10 minutes to outline the issues that you wish to bring to our attention in relation to the independent panel for review of decisions? And again, members will want to ask uh, some questions thereafter. So Brian and James, you are very welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Can you hear us all, everybody okay? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so first of all, may I thank you for the opportunity, Chair, and members to listen to myself and James uh, on behalf of both Jim Shannon and the Calverts. Uh, we regard this as something that we can make a contribution to the subject on, and uh, we've proceeded accordingly. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with the exception of the Chair, try and stay with Chris names because it helps us move this thing forward. Uh, and you will all recognise you have something like 200 pages of documentation here that we're providing. I think it's rather important that we say right from the front that we are providing this to substantiate and support our analysis and forensic activity. And we will refer to specific pages as, as we go through this, if it's of any help in understanding what's going on. Because this particular subject, when we started the research six months ago, we have no doubt it was very, very important for the past, present, but equally the future. I think when we face reducing budgets, increasing challenges with regard to knowledge, if you like, in both the department and elsewhere, and the challenges effectively and likely disputes, we need to make sure we've got a mechanism that will work for everybody going forward. So thank you for that. Um, if I refer first, first of all to document B, I just simply want to say that is an attempt at a chronology and a timeline on judicial reviews associated with single farm payments from as far back as 2011. And the opportunity was provided to DERA and UFU to contribute essentially to that process. With regard to the document that we provided yourselves, which we call the 21 pager from O'Brien and Little, that has had over 100 people circulated too. So we have gone about a very open and transparent engagement process to try and get people to think through these issues. We recognise that a department like yourselves and the committee and the minister have a very, very full agenda. So if we can try and help in this one part of the equation, that's what we are attempting to try and do. Okay. I have also placed on the record written writing my thanks to John McGrath and the team at DERA who professionally provided a lot of the information you can see at revision uh, reference G, which has been really, really helpful in what we're doing, and uh, that is useful. There's, there's one exception, which is a public interest issue that I'll probably return to later on. Okay, so thank you all very much for, for uh, that and uh, sort of bear with us as I now start. I'm going to start, if I can, by reading from uh, Hansard. In the last review that uh, you gentlemen had, or you had as a committee, which was on the 22nd of September 2015, it's at reference A, and at that time, the former chair, William Irwin, was chair. Uh, the current chair was a member, and the current minister, or the interim minister, hopefully shortly back, uh, Minister Pitts in March, basically was also a member. And I want to read for everybody, because I know there's about 150 to 200 people listen to this, exactly what Minister Pitts said at that time. Mr. Pitts, when I was Environment Minister, the Planning Appeals Commission arrived at loads of decisions that I did not agree with, but I accepted them. It's the same when you take a case to a court of law, or wherever, lots of decisions are made. You could think that a certain decision is fundamentally flawed and absolutely disagree with it. 
and say that the court got it wrong. But unless you can appeal to a higher court, you cannot change it. And crucially, however, this singular department in the Northern Ireland Executive, as far as I'm aware, is the only one that will dismiss an appeals panel case that it has lost. It will walk in and with a stroke of a pen say that the case does not meet the criteria. People must not have understood what they were doing. They were too em empathetic to individuals, so we do not accept the panel's decision. With respect, I do not accept what you're doing as a department. I do not accept about what you're doing as aligning closely with European legislation, because the individuals who sit on the panel should be the individuals who have the right to check charge of the decisions that they make. If they do not get the decisions right, they should be held to account. If they're not capable of doing the job, DARD should not appoint them in the first instance. If you appoint people who are capable of understanding complex legislation, Chip, you should have the decency to accept their opinions when those opinions go against what DARD has acted on. And you will all have heard the response from the Minister on the 17th of November to William Irwin's question that basically said, in simple terms, I, I believe effectively that we should not be overturning the decisions of the independent panel. I've made it clear to my officials that I'll not be overturning the decisions of an independent panel, and I've made it clear that that should be the final decision. Now, many of you will, who will have heard that back in as far back as November will have assumed that basically the department were following what the minister had asked to occur. You will assume that effectively there was no re-examination going on and that they were proceeding essentially to implement those decisions. Some of you will know that at the session on the 28th, the question was asked by uh, Mr. Irwin with regard to, thank you for the presentation. I welcome the fact that we moved to legislate in order to make the independent panel's adjudication the final decision. That's very good, Jason, uh, Dr. Foy. And I welcome that. I'm aware by a press reports that a number of cases in which the independent panel has adjudicated in favour of a farmer are sitting with the department because they've still not made the decision on those. What's the reason for that, given the minister's current position on it? And Dr. Foy replied, our position up to this point in time has been, and I underline, and may continue to be, that we need to examine the panel's recommendations at this point. They are still recommendations to ensure that they are in keeping with the law as written and the regulations that still apply to scheme and scheme rules. So it's very important that the department have statutory responsibilities in their mind that they have to discharge as well. So in, in crafting the changes in the legislation, we need to be exceptionally careful about how we deal with that aspect. Okay, you will find uh, in your reference G26 a list actually of the, the eight cases that are currently under review, or seven cases currently under review. And there's a combination there, as you can read, of SMR cases, active farmer cases, and also some uh, uh, entitlement cases. Okay, so I make that point just so that a lot of people in, in talking to me or asking questions of us don't actually realise the challenge that, that we have in getting that legislation changed or, or how we need to go about doing that. Okay, so in short, I, I go back to a comment that you can also read back in 2005, which was asked by Mr. Irwin. I feel I think it's also the feeling of the committee that an independent review panel should make the final decision and that decision should be final. Once you go down the road of nitpicking, what you do and do not agree with, I think it's very unfair to the farmer or to the applicant to the panel. In fairness, any farmers I've been talking to who have gone to an independent review panel understands that it makes the final decisions. As you said, in some cases, that is not the final decision and the department has ruled that. That is an issue. And the gentleman representing Dear Dart Dar at that time said, Mr. Lamont, it is. But again, it's tied up with EU legislation, which empowers the department to make the final decision. Another perspective could be that if you put in place a revised facility or process where the independent panel has a final decision, you would need to ensure that the panel has the knowledge and expertise that is equal to the paying agency and has access to the professional knowledge and skills that the paying agency has access to. Okay? And I think the point that I'm going to deal with, which was raised by uh, John Blair at the last session in terms of the appointments to the committee, the 17 people, and all of that sort of issue, why this is important. 
Now, our paper attempts to explore this from the point of view of planning, the processes, the people, and proper governance. And what I'm going to now do is hand over to James O'Brien, who will take you through whenever the whenever there is only the opportunity of going to the judicial review and where there have been challenges to the department on these issues, what have been the outcomes in the five judicial review cases from 2016 and what are the implications for that for us as we try and change the law? James. Well, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the panel. Uh, first, a little background on myself. I don't know if any of you uh, know me or not. I qualified as a solicitor in 1990. Um, I became a partner in a, a firm in 1993. I have always worked in, in uh, essentially rural practices in country towns. Uh, I set up my own practice in Mahrafelt in 1998. I was a member of the Independent Appeals Panel from 2002 at its inception until 2008. In 2012, I transferred from the solicitor's profession to the bar and have practiced as a barrister since then up until now. I also farm on a part-time basis uh, on the family farm, a uh, former dairy farm, now a suckler beef farm. And I uh, joined the UFU's Legislation Committee in 2011. I was the deputy uh, chairperson of that committee of 2015 to 17 and I was the chair of it from 2017 until 2019. Uh, I do not, however, in, in that capacity, you do not uh, advise the UFU on decisions uh, that they take, such as to commence judicial reviews. That process for that uh, is that that decision is ultimately taken by the board. Uh, generally after recommendations from the uh, executive. Uh, I am also currently a member of the uh, UFU's executive. I am the deputy chair of my uh, local UFU association and in that capacity have a seat on the executive. Uh, I was the junior counsel in the first judicial review brought uh, by the, the UFU or with UFU support, that of Ian Marshall. I had already acted for Mr. Marshall in front of the uh, Independent Appeals Panel, uh, which had recommended that uh, his case be allowed. And that decision is one of those that uh, Brian refers to where it was uh, then rejected. Uh, at the, the start of the judicial review procedure, I had suggested uh, to the UFU that they, they speak to their counterparts in the National Farmers Union uh, to find a senior counsel with specialist knowledge uh, in agriculture and EU law. Uh, Q Mercer QC was the recommendation of the National Farmers Union. Uh, that was how he has uh, been involved in these various Northern Ireland judicial reviews. Uh, he was, in my opinion, an excellent choice. Uh, good to work with, a very knowledgeable. In fact, if any of you, if you Google him, the, the, the depth and breadth of that knowledge that that, that man has is extremely impressive. Uh, regarding the first judicial review, that of Ian Marshall, uh, it involved a refusal to pay single farm payment uh, on the basis that Mr. Marshall had committed an intentional breach uh, of the, uh, the statutory management requirements and that a pollution incident had occurred on his firm. Uh, the uh, breach was, was held to be intentional rather than negligent. In front of the panel, I had argued that it was a negligent breach and the panel had accepted that. That was overruled by Dart, who continued to hold it was intentional and imposed a substantial penalty on his single farm payment on that basis. Uh, the uh, judicial review was then brought to overturn that decision uh, within the arguments that uh, Dart had advanced for their decision. They, they sought to uh, reverse the burden of proof, argued that uh, once the, the breach had incurred, 
uh, that it was for Mr. Marshall to uh, show that it was not intentional, which is a just a, a clear uh, uh, overturning of the, of the rule that should apply. Uh, the, the case was heard by Mr. Justice McGuire. Uh, he gave what, in my view, was a very strong ruling, found very strongly against Guard. Uh, he gave seven reasons for his decision. They're there in the, the judgment, which uh, is, a, is among our papers. Uh, and he uh, remitted the matter. Having found that, he remitted the matter to uh, Guard to make a new decision. He also, in that, he, he stated that that decision should not be made by uh, Mr. Lowry, who had made the first decision that he should not be involved in that process. Uh, he found that he had uh, misdirected himself uh, in coming to the initial decision. Uh, uh, I, I would uh, uh, state that it was my view at the time that I found uh, Mr. Justice McGuire's decision a very strong decision against Dard. Uh, against the, the principles that they had applied and the manner in which they had applied them. The matter was remitted back to them to, uh, uh, come, to come to a new decision. And uh, some four months later, they came back with the same decision. They again turned down Mr. Marshall's case. Uh, they again found that it was intentional. And this occasion, they based it on... Uh, ruling of the European Court of Justice in the case of a Dutch case of, of van der Ham, uh, which had set out uh, principles for uh, intentional behaviour. Now, that decision uh, was made in 2014, although it was uh, an affirmation of the existing law, but it was made in 2014, two years after the events which had occurred on Mr. Marshall's farm, which had given rise to the finding. Uh, now, a second judicial review was brought uh, against that decision. Uh, it did not proceed to hearing. Uh, it was settled after negotiation. Uh, a, a joint statement was issued. Uh, Dard accepted that uh, if, they, if they were to use the van der Ham test, they must give Mr. Marshall opportunities to make submissions in regard to it, and that that had, that had not been done. Uh, they agreed to uh, pay all single farm payment that was due to him uh, and to pay the costs of that uh, those judicial review proceedings, which again was uh, uh, a f further success uh, for the uh, Ulster Farmers Union. One that I feel should have been uh, entirely unnecessary, which should never have been there uh, with a, a second decision. Uh, can, I, can, I take, can I take over here now, James? So in, in, in looking at this, the gentleman that was responsible for their counsel, senior counsel for both JR2 and JR3, which was the challenge of the elimination panels, was a gentleman called Dr. Tony McGinnon. He is one of the top judicial review uh, uh, barristers, uh, QCs, basically, in Northern Ireland. And if you turn to B24, it basically says how much he was charging for the taxpayer, uh, from the taxpayer's point of view, to for his fees. And you will see on both JR2 and 3, they were very, very low numbers. That is, that's in essence says to me, although I obviously am not part of the legal privilege, that he identified right from the start, both on JR2, the one to which uh, uh, we, uh, James has just alluded, it was settled, uh, basically, and also JR3, the elimination. He, 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 he didn't even look as if he spent, or between he and the junior counsel, spent more than about a day and a half looking at the elimination panels issue and concluding that basically that did not carry water legally. Um, if I just move on, I could very, very quickly on to um, JR4 before we come back to JR3. JR4 basically was settled uh, before it went to the leave hearing, uh, was a, a farmer in Fermanagh. And then JR5 basically was the Barnwell Farms case, which was an active farmer's case. 
uh, and uh, uh, James, although he wasn't directly involved in that, can give you some assessment of the relevance of its judgment. I think what I would probably say and like to reinforce here is that on all three levels, that's the process that was involved, the legal side in terms of the law itself, and the most senior officials, that is in the case of JR1, Noel Lavery, the permanent secretary, or in this case, the head of the paying agency, Brian Doherty, they basically were found as that they were not doing what they ought to be doing in accordance with the law. Would you like to say a few words just on JR5, James, and I'll return then to JR3? Well, yes, I, I, I didn't appear in that matter. I, I, have, I, I have read the judgment of concerns uh, whether the applicant qualified as an active farmer. Uh, he had same uh, situation, really, as in Mr. Marshall's case. Uh, he had been turned down by Deere. He had appealed to the independent panel. Uh, they had recommended that his appeal be allowed. It was then turned down again by Deere, and the judicial review uh, was then taken forward. Uh, it was heard by Madam Justice Keegan, and uh, again, it was, uh, in my view, quite a comprehensive judgment and one of, of uh, general uh, relevance setting out the, the issues of what constituted a, a, an active farmer and also the procedures that uh, that should be followed. Uh, again, she was uh, critical in that judgment of the uh, tests that, that Dard had applied uh, in coming to their, their conclusion that they should not follow the panel's recommendation. And uh, she found again that the panel recommendation should have been followed, and uh, that their their reasoning in the matter uh, was not adequate and was not sufficiently rational. Uh, again, it's it's uh, perhaps one of the the drawbacks of the judicial review process as, as a manner of uh, uh, dealing with these matters as, as an appeal that the uh, decision maker. Can ha is required to confine themselves to looking at looking at this decision with uncertain, narrow grounds, uh, uh, as to whether the decision maker has followed all the the relevant tests. Uh, if they have, the uh, judicial review court cannot uh, overturn their decision and substitute their own, even if uh, that uh, decision maker might feel that they would come to a different decision themselves. They have to respect the decision if it has followed uh, the uh, proper legal considerations. That is, uh, so but, uh, I, yes, yes, so Brian, I, so if I can turn now to JR3, and I remind you of, of uh, uh, Claire's question basically at the, at the session on the 28th was, in April 2018, Deere tried to instigate a new single stage process and remove the independent panels. The Ulster Farmers Union filed a judicial review in that case, we call it JR3, and the department reversed it, moved to remove. What was the rationale for the department wanting to do it? Dr. Foy replied, the review was at the time was instigated the request of the minister at the time, and the rationale for that was a fairly high degree of dissatisfaction with the length of time the process was taking and the number of cases. The minister asked for a more streamlined process, would render the department work, whatever, etc. But it was on Dr. Foy says, uh, when, when we, the minister, was it part of their instruction to remove the panel? Mr. Foy, not necessarily specifically to remove the independent panel. I do not think that the minister's instructions were as prescriptive as that. It was to review the process in its entirety and develop a process that was more responsive, with which the farmer had more engagement and involvement, and that was faster in giving final decisions to the farmers. And uh, the following year was the official's decision to try to remove the independent panel at the time, according when the assembly was down. So in that three years that the assembly was suspended, Basically, there was an attempt at that stage, initially by Noel Lavery, and then subsequently by the current permanent secretary, to basically take out the stage two panels in the process. They obviously got the advice, in my view, from the senior council that says legally they haven't really got the ability to do that, and it wasn't likely to work. I would like to just say a little bit about that situation in 2015. There was something like a 
you will see in the paperwork over 800 cases from 2005 to 2014 that had not been addressed and did not get addressed until a team of six people were allocated to it by Dr. McMacken in 2018 and 19 to clear it up before Brexit. On top of that, we had active farmers, some 800 cases of active farmers and young farmers, and it was as if there were something like two to 3,000 cases in that period in 2005 and 16 to be resourced and sorted out. And the, the proposition was, if we stick out the independent panels, that will save us time. That was entirely wrong. I'm glad that Dr. McLean advised the department, as it would appear, that you need to settle this and go back and fix the basics. So that, that's really, really very important. I have been able to verify that position with Minister McElveen, broadly speaking, in October, and that would be to the best of her recollection what happened too. I refer particularly to a response from the UFU, a gentleman called James McCluggage, uh, to the consultation that was put out in 2017, and you'll find that in the document um, uh, F, F, F5 to 7, basically, F5 to 7. So uh, that's basically the, the legal background to this. Now, I, I now, if I can, want to return to why I spend a little bit of time explaining why we think this particular aspect is important. Because what it basically says is when... When, whenever anybody does take this to court, on the two judgments, Hugh Mercer has got win. Two have had to be settled, and the other was settled earlier. And these are decisions that are being made on the interpretation of law at the senior levels, but they cost over £100,000 to do. We have to find a way that basically we can combine sufficient legal knowledge with the panel and we view that as being the Supreme Agricultural Panel, that we can actually do these for four to five thousand pounds and not a hundred thousand pounds effectively going forward. Okay. So if I can just refer here to the, the suggestion with regard to the Supreme Agricultural Panel on page two, if I just walk through that and then we will finish within the next three minutes. Basically, changing the law to the final decision is not likely to be sufficient. We have to try and protect this other aspect of DERA's view of their responsibilities and how they can discharge those in accordance with the law. The Supreme Agricultural Panel is supposed to be a five-person panel. We were asked to write more, which we've done at page 18 to 19, as to how we think that might work and what it could work for. And specifically, we have already had a, a, a confirmation from Dr. Um, or Mr. Mercer, the QC, on the five judicial review cases. He is also a Deputy High Court Judge in England, and he has offered, if the Minister was minded, to help be one of the people who chair that group for the first three years at effectively, obviously, much lower commercial rates, Deputy Judge rates, just to help. He is also particularly mindful that the whole protocol dimension and the European side of this is likely to add even further complexity for us in Northern Ireland. Uh, just for completeness, we have asked uh, just earlier this week whether Dr. McLean would also consider uh, uh, whether he could allocate five to seven days at most per year to help him in this particular area. Clearly, both those gentlemen can earn considerably more elsewhere, but hopefully in the spirit of public service, if they were prepared to do that, and the minister and yourselves were minded to help with this proposition and making it real with the department, then that would make uh, considerable sense. Uh, as far as we are concerned, in, in respect of the five-person panel, uh, to, to deal with the point that John Blair was asking about, the 17 people and the need to refresh that panel in 2022, you just simply don't have enough people with agriculture and law knowledge. You need to get a blend of both. And that's the reason why we suggest that three members who do stage two panels would also participate on that supreme panel going forward as well. Okay. There's one other aspect with regard to something that was agreed in 2018 that, that is a problem for a number of cases that have been in touch with us, and that is that they're not being allowed to put in new evidence and other issues 
which effectively need to be considered in the stage two panel after stage one, when, when they take the view that basically they only really understood what they were being required to present at that point in time. And we think, frankly, legally that's not right and, and should be undone at that point in time and, and set back. And then finally, with regard to historic cases, uh, it's our view that basically we could consider historic cases. Uh, I, I can say a little bit about my own background here. I was involved in Westminster in something called the business, uh, 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 BBRS, the, the business banking repair scheme. It's a voluntary scheme from seven banks. It the formally launches actually next Monday. And it's a, it goes back to 2001. And although there could be theoretically be 60,000 complaints, what it's really targeted at is the three to four to 500 people in the past who still wake up every day worrying about they haven't had justice or haven't had a resolution. And that scheme is something that I think will be helpful for those individuals. And similarly, in the case, if you ask me questions about how many people we've had in contact, I can deal with that. Now, I apologize. We've taken a little bit longer than, than we wanted in the written briefing. Hopefully that hasn't upset you and that provides some background. And, and thank you very much for listening. Um, uh, thank you, Brian and James. Um, th that was an amazing amount of detail and information that you provided to us. And um, the amount of work you, you've done in preparation for this is phenomenal. So uh, it's a very, very, very uh, helpful contribution. And I think that th this is um, an issue which ha affects a lot of farmers. Um, Indeed, I've I've attended with farmers at these independent panels before in the past, and the sense of um, frustration and disillusionment uh, with the farmers whenever the, um, the the panel finds in their favour, the department doesn't accept that is is um, something that that needs to be changed. And uh, you know, we, we certainly I think there was broad welcome at the committee meeting uh, whenever Mr. Foy presented to us uh, recently. Um, where they indicated that the department would be introducing legislative changes to give uh, powers to the independent panel to um, so that their 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 saying their findings would be um, binding. Um, I'm going to ask Harry here. Harry, you you you're down to ask a question. Harry Harvey. Um, Harry. Yep. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, good to see you, James and Brian. Um, well, you know that the department. Thank you, Harry. Okay, yep. You know the department are happy to progress with this issue and instate the panel as a final decision making body in relation to appeals. Ministers, you know, as already stated, as well as to do such, but obviously it's going to need to go through proper legislation with the usual consultant state. So, as yeah. previously, suge previously suggested, that the independent panel was too apathetic in the consideration of numerous appeals which therefore, in the view of the department, clouded their professional judgment. This was previously cited by officials as a reason why the department didn't always agree with the decision of the panel. What would your assessment be of this? Thank you. James, would you like to take yes. your experience first? Um, yes. Uh, well, I have, as I stated, considerable experience of sitting on these panels. Uh, yeah. I, I would... Uh, I, I would doubt that. I, I would dispute it in its entirety, certainly from my own uh, personal uh, hands-on experience of, of panels. I never found that to be the case. Uh, uh, the, the panels always reached their decision within the law, and there were, there were times uh, it, the, the, for the department to, to say that members were too empathetic. Uh, even if they had a de degree of sympathy for the applicants, that's uh, something that all uh, bodies in any judicial or quasi-judicial position have to, to uh, deal with. And it's not something that you let cloud your judgment. You may have sympathy for an applicant for the, the hard times that they're suffering or whatever, but you, ha you have to reach your decision within the confines of the law. And it has always been my experience that panels did so. Uh, since 2008, I have represented a number of applicants in front of panels. And again, that would always be my experience. The decisions reached, the judgments written, or the conclusions found, they were always reasoned. 
and professional and well drafted. Uh, they, they, they weren't governed by empathy or sympathy. They, they, they always found a, a reasoned analysis within the law and found uh, within the law, and I would say on probably many occasions, uh, the findings went against any natural sympathy that they had for the applicants and that they, they decided the manner, the, the case in a, in a proper manner. Uh -huh. Okay. These, these, are generally, these, these are professional individuals, they're lawyers, they're uh, retired civil servants or, or public officials, they're, they're generally uh, uh, professional uh, knowledgeable individuals are not they're not governed by sympathy mm -hmm. well listen one of the key findings by justice kagan against the department was the failure to engage with the core issues being raised by the applicant in your view how can this be better addressed moving forward well the, the core issue here basically was that the head of the pain agency brian Dockerty did not pay sufficient attention with the technical people assessing it as to what the independent panel were actually considering, had said, etc. And in fact, Judge Keegan, as you've, you've alluded to there, uh, Harry, has basically said, look, until you deal with that, how can I possibly make an assessment or how can you make any assessment of this being right? I mean, I think I, I'll add to this little bit about empathy. I can tell you, Dr. McMacken doesn't have an awful lot of empathy because he, he, for the 80 months that Ian... Uh, Marshall and 62 months that by Calvert had basically no money. It would, they got the equivalent of a, the borrowing rate, effectively a 1% over bank payment rate, as compensation for the hassle that they've been through for the previous 60 months. And that's against the backdrop that, that we're lectured about managing public money properly. Let's be clear these judicial reviews have cost the department over £300,000 and a quarter of a million UFU funds that should never, never have been necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay, and on the Supreme Panel proposal, if the current independent panel is given final decision-making authority instead of only being a recommendatory body, would this not negate the need for an additional panel? Well, the right of appeal would therefore be to the independent review panel. Who would rule on that appeal? Okay, so that, that's a very good question, Harry. And the, and the reason why we have come to the view that we need to have the Supreme Panel with the expertise shared by somebody like Hugh Mercer or a Tony McLean is that it brings that legal dimension and keeping that up to date on the discipline side. And it also affords the department with the view that if you're still uncomfortable, these people don't understand the law. You take it to people who know. So the, 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 the idea of people who make the official decision that says this doesn't comply with the law and the independent panel is still wrong, that is up to them to then basically justify their existence to that panel. And that panel is £5,000 in my estimate, not £100,000. We have to find a way of providing a proper dispute resolution process. And if we have people like the quality of Hugh Mercer and co offering to help to do this, at, at essentially the rates he's talking about, and, and Tony McLean as well, would be, would be great, because that gives the department the, the, the bit in legislation that basically says that group become the people that make sure we keep the law. Okay. In relation to the super... As a backdrop. Okay. In relation to the super appeals panel, what costs would be imposed on applicants yeah. and the department per case and even a totality ban? Thank you. Yes. Okay. So, so we have put a, a proposal in, uh, basically, of a the farmer would pay for up to potentially fifteen hundred pounds, and our current proposal was that wouldn't be refunded. We're, we're sort of thinking about that, but I'll come back to that in a minute. But in principle, the aim that they would be looking at would be greater than five thousand pounds. If you took the judge's rate for a day and a preparation day plus the other panels, we are estimating the cost to be around. Five thousand pounds or something of that nature, okay? But probably it's five percent of what it currently is to try and do those. Uh, we also anticipate, by the way, there probably won't be any more, including historically, maybe more than three or five cases a year, okay? 
the historic thing I, I, I'm probably going to get a question on, I'll come back to you later. So that's, that's our estimate uh, on the process. I think I think it's very important, actually, we, we do need to recognise that DARE do have a statutory responsibility to meet the law, but we don't need to have the only solution as 100,000 additional review. And that's quite wrong. Yeah. Okay, and just to finish, the Super Appeals Panel, what personal responsibility would be placed on the individual panel member? Given the panel would carry responsibility of the final decision. Okay, change you want to pick up. I, I don't really understand your question, or I have to say. Maybe that's maybe that's a, you're gonna say that that's maybe a lawyer's get out, but it's not intended that way. <laughs> uh, what, what do you mean by responsibility? Well, obviously they have the responsibility <laughs> of the decision, so you know. Just wondering, uh, you know. Well, the, 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 the proposed individuals that we have suggested to chair this panel are highly experienced. Yeah, uh, it's a lawyers, uh, Very well capable of assessing this and, and coming to a reasoned decision. I suppose it's, it's ultimately comes back to what Brian said at the beginning. Uh, yes, if, if the don't find in the person's favour. There's always going to be an element of, well, you know, I believe that panel got that wrong. But you have that with any decision-making body. You have it at the minute where a person's decision is made by a, a DRA official. Yes. Uh, you know, you have that responsibility to consider it and, and, and get the, the proper decision. They, they would also, uh, if they're making that decision as a a quasi-judicial body, they would ultimately be subject to the, the rules of judicial review and to the sanctions of judicial review. That's an important point, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I think I think the key here really is to make sure that with, with Dr. Foley, the legislation is written in such a way that we're protecting, if you like, all the parties involved in this, in this particular activity. And by the way, I have written directly to Dr. Foy since they gave evidence about a week ago and then provided a lot of information. So I'm hopeful that we will, in fact, engage with him to sort of talk through these issues. Harry, you did ask the other question about £1,500, and, and uh, yeah. I didn't respond entirely to that. We, we, have, we have sort of reconsidered that since. Uh, the current situation would probably be that in stage two you would get your money back, okay, uh, and therefore you could have that suggestion here. I think, James, in my view at this point in time, would be the actual Supreme Panel should decide what proportion or how much of that money would be returned to the applicant. But obviously, if the applicant is confident in their case, they would have a 300% plus return in that the claim, if they win it, is greater than £5,000. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Patsy? Patsy Malone? Can you hear me, Patsy? Right now. Hi, Patsy. Okay. I'm online there now. Hi. Oh, Patsy, yes. Thank, thank you, Patsy. Patsy. And for, for your details now, uh, you've already you've sat in and you've given considerable research to the evidence that has been given to us and the information by the department. Yeah. Uh, just bear with me as I talk this through. I'm intrigued by this notion of a supreme agricultural panel. And I'm not disputing that you need experts and you need them here and there and everywhere. But right. So I just want to talk this process through you now because uh, James, as he was talking there, and James is a very knowledgeable person in the law. What I wanted to find out was the department has said to us that they're going to change to So the independent panel, and James has been a member of that, and uh, the independent panel, the department will uphold that and they'll adhere to the decision of the independent panel. Now, um, and we've just heard the evidence that uh, someone may refer their case to the Supreme Agricultural Panel. Okay, now, there's two or three things emerging from that. Um, and James will know where I'm going because he's been on enough Social Security appeal tribunals to know and the circumstances under which you refer those to the likes of the Social Security Commissioner, which is almost the type of, of situation you're talking about. It has to fit in terms of process or natural justice or an element of a piece of information that should have been taken into consideration, wasn't taken into consideration by by the independent panel. We call them the, the uh, 
the tribunal, for want of a better word. So, right, we come to the stage where, for some reason or other, a decision of the independent panel is referred to this this uh, Supreme Agricultural Panel. Now, you're saying then that if somebody's dis disenchanted with the outcome of that, they can take it to a JR. Now, presumably, now this is where I'm going, and James may well already be there before me, presumably along that process, that may well open up the opportunity to get us right back to square one where we were before, where the department itself may intervene, either by way of requesting to make a submission to that Supreme Agricultural Panel, or to, in fact, JR, the decision of the Supreme Agricultural Panel. So, in essence, what we could be doing is introducing a multi-tiered level of scrutiny and review here, only to open up a further can of worms. And, in other words, you're obviating the actual problem by creating a further problem. Right. So I, I, you're opening up you're opening up another channel for the department just to negate the good work that's being done and trying to rectify something by obliging them to adhere to the decision of the independent panel in the first place. Right. So, so I'm just so, gonna, so, and I'm just saying uh, right. I'm sure you're conscious of that and you're Absolutely. aware of it, but um w whenever you open another tier of um, of uh, legalities, uh, those are subject to people who could justifiably argue, look, we want to make a case to this, in this instance, the department. Right. So, so I think that just to walk through that, Patsy, is a very good question. Okay. So if we make the independent panel the final arbiter, okay, and yeah. they essentially are trying to consider all the law regulations, whatever, there are to be very few situations on which an agricultural person within the department still feels that wrong, okay? The only route available today, and probably in the legislation as it would be currently intended to change, is that you'd have to take that to a judicial review at £100,000, okay? We're talking about probably one of the top two to three individuals in the country on judicial reviews, basically, particularly on some of this agriculture stuff, the Hugh Mercer. And I think the probability of somebody saying to somebody of that ilk, really don't understand what you're doing legally, when the one, two cases settle three here, uh, which is a five out of five record, would tend to suggest it's pretty unlikely that would occur. Sorry, I don't get your point there, Brian. Um, something being pretty unlikely and my being, point is being the, actual can be two the, different the quality, the quality, no, no, the quality of the guys who are on the Supreme Panel who are legally chairing that will be acutely aware, effectively, of what all the laws and regulations and whatever else are. And the point is, I suppose I'm making is, if, if Mr. Mercer was chairing this as our expectation, he would be one of the chairs, alternating probably with A and other, basically, he would know exactly what the risks were if anything been challenged by the department. I mean, fundamentally, he'd won two cases out of two, and he settled three cases out of three. Uh, I mean, this, this, that, that, this that, is top notch. That doesn't make a point. The, the capacity of one individual doesn't make the point, or doesn't, uh, for, well, to my mind, anyway. I'm not disputing his or her capacity. Uh, yeah. What I'm saying is it just doesn't mean that they're not subject to challenge. No, no. Well, that, that's fair. But I think the, I mean, the bottom line is we've had four challenges out of 300 cases on two out of independent panels. There have been yeah. 50 cases which basically had, were overruled by the department. Only two of those cases went to judicial review because nobody else could afford it. And when, when you ask me about some of the historical cases, some of you, I'm going to tell you my experience to date. No, but my point being is that those those that are being challenged were because the department overruled, and this is the, the whole point of our discussion, I presume, anyway. The yeah. whole point of it was that the department overruled the, the right decisions of an independent panel, and people had gone were very, very frustrated that yes. the department overruled it. So Correct. if you're introducing a mechanism which removed the capacity or the wherewithal of the department to overrule that, what sorts of cases should be going to this panel then? Very few, because but in principle, the only basis on which they can challenge it is the DERA panel don't actually understand what the law is. They've got it wrong. That's the only basis on which they can do that. 
purely the law or the regulation. Hence the reason why three good agricultural people and one or two good legal people. So, so out of those 50 people that were basically since 2015 and two went to them, what we're probably saying is the, the vast majority of those basically had no route forward after the independent panel was slowed down, basically, in terms of recommendation, and they had no ability to challenge that legally or in any other way because it was a £100,000 judicial review. No, get all that. Um, and then the capacity for the department for to open that up for the department then to challenge the decision that um, they hadn't been able to potentially well, under the new legislation to challenge that at the Supreme Agriculture Panel or even well, to JR. Patsy, I think if the technical people in DERA feel that they're that, they're that good and they're that strong in the law of overruling both the independent panel and they're going to go have a good go at the uh, Supreme Agriculture Panel, I'd wish them good luck. Didn't stop them before, overruling people, good people that, and uh, well, one of them here, sitting on the on very knowledgeable person yeah. sitting on the panel before. Partially, um, the one thing that I, and I could say to that, if you, if you permit me, I, I do yeah. take your point that yes, uh, they, they could they could bring a judicial if the panel has the final decision, then yes, that would be subject to judicial review scrutiny. Uh, yeah. Idea, mm -hmm. but uh, I would you, you, I can't put it any further than what Brian has said. Yes, it's not it's not very likely. The reason I think it's not very likely is this: it's it's easy at the minute for dear yeah. we make mm -hmm. the decision they overrule it, and it's often been the case, and it's not confined to dear. All the government departments take this approach too. They make their decision and yeah. they put it, they put it to the applicant in the position. It's unstated, but it's it's not stated, but it's there. If you don't like our decision, you take it to judicial review. They are now going to be in the reverse of that. They will right. have to make the case for judicial review. Yeah. They will have to get past the, yes. the leave hearing. They will have to show very, very good grounds. And I would agree entirely with Brian, with the caliber of this Supreme Agriculture Panel, that's not very likely. You know, that's, no, to, to answer your question, no, we cannot rule it out. Once you give anyone a decision, power, yes. that power is subject to judicial review scrutiny. But the reality of it is you, you have a, a stage you must firstly get leave. You must show the yes. balance of probabilities that there's a case. The, the, the onus would move to DERA to have to do that rather than the onus being on an applicant that has been turned down by DERA. Can I, can I deal with this another way, actually, Patsy? And, and, and when issued the consultation in, in 2017, PARA 5 said this, 4.5, it's not enough to state the department's decision is incorrect. It's for the farmer to demonstrate how the initial decision is incorrect. It's important they provide as much information and evidence as possible. So the onus is basically on the farmer. We view that it should read as follows. It's not enough to state the independent panel's final decision is incorrect. It's for the department to demonstrate in its response why it believes legally the panel is wrong. Furthermore, those officials who have made that decision must be prepared to provide the legal information and evidence to the Supreme Panel and attend and support SAIM in front of the SAB should the applicant decide to appeal to the SAB. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a couple of more members here who are looking in. Thanks, meantime. All right, for the meantime, Patsy. Um, um, uh, 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 William, William is next on the list. William Irwin. William? Can you hear me, William? Can you hear me? Yes, William, go ahead. Yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and can I thank Brian, and um, can I thank you for your presentation? Uh, uh, just, I know you've been laboured on this particular question, but as you know, Dr. Point last week, uh, said on behalf of the department that in the future the department would be taking on board the recommendation of the minister and would be accepting the independence panel's recommendations as final. Well, well, you, can I correct you? He specifically in response to you said this, our position up to this point and may continue to be that we need to examine the panel's recommendations at this point to ensure they're in keeping with the law. He has not, it's like the minister's comment, he has not said to you 
that that will be the final decision and there is no legal challenge. And, and that's the point that Jim and I want to drive through. If they change the legislation to letting that occur, fine. No need for a Supreme panel. Okay, that makes it clear then. I, I think that that would be very important. I think I think we can have a situation. It's, it's, for many years, I have um, highlighted the situation. I have represented people that, uh, with independent panels or reviews and found that many farmers were frustrated and left angry with the decision that they thought they'd won their case and then only to find out a number of weeks later that the independent pounds decision had been overruled by the department. So I think that that, that that makes it clear. I understand where you're coming from now. I think it's very important that in any future uh, decision by the department or, or uh, in put in legal text, that the, the independent panel's view is final. In that situation, you don't think there's a necessity for your supreme panel then, if that was the case? If the legislation is absolutely clear, the legal responsibilities and everything is basically there, the, the reason why we have this process, essentially, of the judicial review is that the next stage cannot be a £100,000 problem for an applicant. It simply can't. No, I, I'd accept that, and, and, and that, that, that's why there's so few judicial reviews because many people couldn't afford it. Um, in sure. relation, in relation to historical uh, cases, um, the assembly uh, was in operation from 2018 uh, for three years almost. A number of decisions were made during that time, um, and I have one sitting here in the desk. A similar situation whereby um, the independent panel ruled in favour of the young farmer and then subsequently the department overruled that. Can you see a way forward in that situation? Yes, uh, I maybe best deal with that in terms of historical cases. Um, some of you may have heard me sandwich in uh, the Farmgate programme between Jason Foyce, Evans, yourselves, and, and the chair's comment with regard to the mini inquiry, uh, where I'd referred to the number of people calling into Mr. Shannon's office or me or whatever. So, just to try and summarise that for you and then deal with the point that, that Rosemary quite rightly raised the last time was so far, there have been some 37 uh, different individuals or cases that have come across Jim or my or whatever case, okay? When we work our way through those, there are cases between 2001 and 2012, cases from 2012 up to 17, and cases after 2017. But before I do that, I need to say to you that in my view so far, I have only heard six people who are prepared to go forward to a panel to have it challenged, okay, and effectively, in my view, have sufficient evidence to justify that position the vast majority of people are too scared of the department, are too scared of their wives to go and raise this issue again, etc., and have sort of moved on in terms of their life. Now, I can relate to this. I referred earlier to the business bank scheme back to 2001. Although there's potentially a reservoir of 60,000 people, there's probably only three to 400 people. So it won't surprise you, uh, I hope, but my provisional view is, even if you let all the people here to go forward to the Supreme Panel for the historic cases, I doubt if there will be more than 10 or 12 cases. And a lot of you may decide, well, we don't legally need to do this, and it doesn't really matter. But I can tell you, for those 10 individuals, which probably includes your young farmer that you're just alluding to, this is something that most days they get up and think about. And from a mental health point of view and whatever else, we should try and find a way of allowing those historic cases to be uh, assessed. I've also basically had a whole lot of people telling me uh, basically uh, £1,500 is really too much to do it. And then in the same breath, they tell me they're owed £70,000 or £80,000. Well, if they know how to make more money out of farming with that return, if they're confident in their position, really, that's up to them. I mean, it's insane. if been if, if, if they're confident in their case and what they're doing, they should have the confidence to go forward and spend fifteen hundred pounds to do this. It's not a large amount of money if the claim is greater than five thousand. And I'll finish by saying that my current assessment is I very much doubt whether the total value of all of what will come forward and we'll find out in the next month will be more than the amount of money that has been wasted in judicial reviews by the department 
or by the trade uh, union trying to support us. I had been less than half a million quid. Okay. Um, it's important to those individuals. Okay, we're we'll going to move on here. Rosemary? Rosemary? Rosemary, Rosemary yeah. here? Yeah, go ahead, Rosemary. Okay, yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, James and Brian, thank you very much for your presentation. Again, very informative, very interesting. I want to perhaps continue on what um, William was speaking about there earlier on. It's in relation to the pl panel, in relation to the panel. Surely a simple answer, you know, you've sort of partially answered it, would be an example of what we already have in planning, in the planning appeals and benefit appeals, where you have this simple planning and the applicant that has been turned down, they appeal to that panel. That decision is taken. The panel takes that decision. And then if the department don't like it, surely it's up to them to challenge that, not the applicant uh -huh. again, to go through another pro appeals process. Uh, and, and that's a yeah. very good point, Rosemary. Very good point in terms of who should be the person that pushes that back. I would take the view that basically you have to allow the applicant the view to say, do they want to continue to be involved trying to defend their position or explain their position? You would have to substitute those that individual with the independent panel justifying their position to that law or something else instead. So... I think the point I'm making, I can relate to what you're saying, but ultimately, if, if they're to say no and are prepared to challenge it, it has to be the applicant or the independent panel that wish to challenge that. It could be either. And okay. Yeah, well, I would imagine the independent panel. Yeah, that's, that's would, definitely not Surely the independent uh, panel would be... Yeah, yeah, you could do. You could have the independent yeah. panel go and do the okay. position to to, okay. to the to the supreme panel. Yeah, you could. Okay, was right. Have enough. Yeah. Um, uh huh. Thank, thank you. And um, you talked about you, you're quite interested. In, sorry, just one minute. Yeah, the go ahead. Start cases. You believe there should. You believe there should be um, should be a push also. Or should be thought given looking at the historic cases, especially during the time when Stormont wasn't sitting. R Rosemary, I actually believe it should be looked at as an entirety, okay. and I'm going at it mostly from the point of view of what's fair and reasonable. You asked a very, very good question last uh, fortnight ago with regard to what the position was in the devolved governments, etc. And you were basically told that with the exception yeah. of our country, basically all the other ministers were involved. Jim Chan was able to confirm to me a couple of weeks ago, both in England yeah. and Wales, the ministers signed off these things. In our subsequent research, and you've probably seen it in the Hansard document as well, that in 2012, that was changed, essentially. And therefore, I question, you know, if, if there's never been any political discussion or debate around that, why did suddenly the minister come out of the loop? And to take Harry's point for the last time when he asked the question, I didn't realise the significance at the time of, did we ever have a minister challenge an independent panel? Well, the short answer is, after 2012, they didn't see it. And as Edwin basically says, now I know why nobody's giving me any of these things that they're turning down. They're not giving it to me. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Rosemary, right, John... Right, thank you. Okay, Rosemary. Uh, John, John Blair. John? Chairman, you can try, yeah. Uh, Chairman, was mentioning me there by Brian of the uh, comments I had made and questions I've asked in relation to the appointment of the panels. Um, I'm keen to hear yes. about the that I understand there would be a, a limit to some extent of the available fuel, but also I have concerns with any panel um taking decisions you're making recommendations um on, on legislative issues and especially where there's reimbursement involved should have some recorded appointment system um that there should be a level of accountability in that regard and also obviously Brian, my uh concerns were based on the very lengthy duration served um by existing panels yeah 
I, I think uh, in terms of your comment last time in the reply you had from Gregor and Co, the panels have been in existence, as you heard, for three, five plus years. They're, they are due to renew them again or decide what they do in January 2022. You quite rightly asked the issue about the public appointments process and everything to that. And I believe uh, Jason basically replied that that all needs to be looked at. We, yeah. we, would, certainly, we would certainly agree with that. I think that the, the specific point we probably are wanting to try and emphasize, that's from James and I, is that there is a relatively small pool of capable people here that we all sort of need to recognize. And a pool of something like 20 is probably sufficient not only to support the independent panels, but actually provide the three additional members that would rotate, if you like, within the Supreme Panel, should that become something that has to be put in place. Okay, well, we can review that as we go forward, but thanks for that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, again, as we sort of think that, that, that those two particular individuals uh, effectively offering their services, would they, if they were, were doing so, should be definitely seriously, seriously considered by the Minister and yourselves as particularly dealing with the historical cases and probably the very few cases going forward. Okay, thank you. That's good. Um, Okay, listen, we've been around the room here and all of the members um, have had good questions and uh, answers, well answered. Um, Brian uh, and James, uh, and thank you for, for your input today. Um, I, suppose, I suppose what's one of the things just to finish off there, you know, would you, would you accept that the main issue is that the decision of the independent panel is upheld? Would you broadly expect yeah. that? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. uh, I think that I think that's kind of a consensus around the room as well. But yeah. uh, listen, I want to thank you very much. No doubt we'll be in contact and we'll have further yeah. engagements as time progresses. You know, and yeah. uh, so well, we're we're hoping, Chair, to also engage if we can now with each of the stakeholders and the department to try and do as much behind the scenes to try and work our way through. So what comes out in consultation is as high a level of consensus as we can to making it as easy as possible. Brilliant, thank you. And again, your evidence will you know, provide you, we'll consider that your evidence as well as part of our wider yeah. work on this issue as well with all our stakeholders. So thank you very much, Brian and James. It's nice to put a face to a name. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 Okay, members, um, we're moving on now to item eight on the agenda, a written briefing COVID-19 up, uh, COVID uh, uh, update. Uh, I want to refer members to the February written update from the Department of Pages 246, 246 to 254 of your pack. If there's any particular questions that the, the members want to raise in relation to that there, I think it would be useful to forward them to uh, Stella by the close of play today. Is that, is that okay? Um, okay, members, can you use all online there? Yeah. Yeah, it just disappeared on me there for a second. Okay, uh, the no, item number nine, uh, again, a written briefing on the transition fortnight. Um, um, I want that's page two, fifty six. We want to just uh, share the members any questions you've heard of the end of the day today. Okay. Um, Okay, members, item number 10 in your pack uh, is review of the cost of the fee for an external independent panel under the Department's Review of the Systems Procedure. Um, the written briefing from the Department is page 262. Members, to make sure that you're on mute because we're in the Or maybe South Africa. <laughs> Okay, the written briefing from the Department is pages 262 to 268. I want to advise members that the Department has now concluded this consultation on the review of the cost of the fee of an external independent panel assessment on the Department's review of decisions. Um, the committee had requested a summary of the consultation responses, and this is Annex A at page 264. The Department advised the Minister's proposal the cost of the external independent assessment remains unchanged at £200. The Department further advises that the Minister, um, uh, the Department further advises that the, that the Minister has asked that the independent panel should make the final decision in the cases referred to it, as opposed to the recommendation, and that fits well in with the previous discussion. 
the evidence we've had from those witnesses. The Department of Business is currently taking forward this work, which will require the laying of new legislation. Um, members, have any comment in relation to that there? Okay. Am I enough? Uh, if there are anything you want to follow up to, just follow, forward it into uh, Stella. Um, okay. Item number uh, 11 is uh, corresponds to page 276 to um, 218. Uh, I want to draw attention to the following. Page 304 from the Trade Unions to the Mayor of Mid, Mid East Antrim Borough Council on the security issues at Lauren Port. There is a table of correspondence from the trade unions requesting to brief the committee on the issues regarding the withdrawal of staff at Lauren Port. Um, do members have any views on this request? Um, uh, they're content that they've invited to brief the committee. Um, do we have any particular views on this? Okay. Um, okay, this will necessitate moving one of the already scheduled oral evidence sessions. And sorry, request and the invite to brief the committee uh, on the 18th of February, which is next week. This will necessitate uh, moving one of the already scheduled oral sessions. Dara has asked if the waste, crime and, and the boys can be moved to a later date. Will the committee can tell we move this 18th of March to allow the trade unions to come in next week. Yeah, that's okay. Can I refer members to written briefing from the Horticulture Forum at page 308? This is very useful note that members may wish to take a few moments to read. And uh, you probably have looked at it already uh, whenever the pack was issued. Um, our members content this based on our committee webpage and that we write on behalf of the forum to Minister Goves and Eustace. Yep. Yep. Um, can I seek agreement from here that all of the items of correspondence committee receives in relation to EU matters are published on the committee's website? Okay. And are we happy that? We action the correspondence suggests in the index page sheet, page 270 to 275. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I want to just, um, page item 12 now, forward work program. Uh, I want to refer members to the draft for work program at page 320 to 329. Uh, I want to advise members of following the the departmental written evidence on education provision at Caffrey scheduled for the of February. The department has now advised that the written briefing that we would be providing will be a duplication of the one considered by the committee at the meeting on the 14th of January. As now suggested, an oral briefing. However, this could only be scheduled post Easter. Um, are they happy with uh, an oral or written briefing? What do you think? Uh, Oh, I, sorry, that's Rosemary coming in for AOB. We're not just there yet. Um, okay. Um, we're due to have a written briefing on um, NAFIS. Um, okay. The department oral briefing has been scheduled on the PFG for the 25th of March. I'm in line with the department's target for publication of the Green Strategic Growth Strategic Framework. Would therefore be more informative? Okay. The department has requested that the oral briefing on waste, crime, and uh, update and boy shows it as deferred to the 18th of March. Uh, are we, we're okay with that there? We can defer that to the 18th of March? Yes. Okay. Um, NAPA has now confirmed its attendance for the oral session on the 11th of March, and the coordinator for NA Farms Group has suggested that the committee contact organization members and divisions to seek their views on the independent panel for review of decisions. Members can attempt to take written submissions from the National Beef Association, from the NI Livestock Auctioneers uh, Association, Farmers for Action, and also the, the LMC on this issue. Are members, okay, we yeah. reach out to them to get their views yeah. on this? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, the arrangements for a joint meeting with the Committee for the Economy and Infrastructure and HMRC are, are now underway, and members will be notified of the final date in due course. The meeting is likely to be a Wednesday, as that is the day of the meeting, both the economy and the infrastructure committees. Um, mm -hmm. will be a virtual meeting. HMRC has now advised the following issues are not within the remit and lie within either uh, DEFRA or the Cabinet Office. Issues of groupage, and particularly agri-food groupage, is a DEFRA issue. The working relationship on the ground with DERA is a DEFRA issue. Uh, very specific questions on the import of seeds, plants, livestock, which may come up a DEFRA issue. Unfettered access NA to uh, Britain is a cabinet office matter. And the three, uh, the grace parade is a cabinet office matter. Okay. 
I remember it was a call that we had already written to Mr. Minister Gove on these matters. Okay. So, update on uh, S S E S, uh, providing oral evidence committee. Uh, can I advise members that we have now received a written briefing on the role and remit of the SES, Shared Environmental Services, and that will be in the pack for next week. However, no data has yet been forthcoming for its attendance, and committee staff have found it difficult to get in touch with anyone by phone. And can I suggest that the committee write to the Chief Executive and Director of Development, asking them to provide a suitable date for attendance and reminding men um, of the section 44 powers available to the committee to compel witnesses to attend. Okay. Yeah. I advise members that the UK Office of Environmental uh, Protection has been in touch with the committee staff in connection with the meeting. The suggested dates are 9 a.m. on the second, Tuesday, 2nd of March, 3 p.m. on Tuesday, 2nd of March, after 1 p.m. on Thursday, 3rd of, 4th of March, 9 or 10 a.m. on Thursday, 4th of March, after 2 p.m. on Thursday, 11th of March. The forward program is fully booked for 4th of March. Because we indicate that Thursday the 11th of March at 2.30 p.m. would be suitable. And can I suggest that in preparations meeting, we ask DERA for a written brief on the role, remit and responsibilities for the OEP in connection with this jurisdiction and for a breakdown of, on any funding that provides to OEP for its services. Would that be okay? Um... Okay, we're coming to item 13, AOB, and Rosemary has indicated she wants to raise an item under AOB. Rosemary? Rosemary? Rosemary, you might be a mute there. Okay. Yep. You okay? Can you hear me now, Rosemary? Can you hear me? Yep, yep. yep. Yes? Okay. No, it's just, it's just in relation to... Uh, it's in relation to the COVID funding and funding that's been sent back to sent back. Um, Northern Ireland shows associations, uh, you know, that hold agriculture shows throughout Ireland. Many, many of them obviously didn't take part, did take place last year, and as a result, many of them have lost their lost their power to make income because they have continued expenses. And I'm wondering, is it possible for perhaps um, to be considered in the COVID funding pot? That's, I know it's a very short time to get it distributed out, but for them to put a case forward to the minister. Yeah, remember content that we make uh, and take that as a representation to the department. Stella, you can take note of that there. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, uh, is there any other, uh, as members, any other items? Okay. Okay, okay members. Um, Morning 14 is the date and time next meeting. We're meeting next Thursday, 18th of February at 10 a.m. And we'll be meeting virtual just like today which will be streamed on the Assembly website. Just don't turn off your screens yet because we're going into closed session. So um, I want to advise members that we'll move into the closed session to discuss our response to the Department's budget proposals. Um, could I ask the broadcasting to place the uh, committee members and all of the committee and the staff in a closed and closed session, please? And once we get that confirmation, we can... This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.